Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining today's FOIA Advisory Committee meeting. Before we begin, please ensure that you have opened the WebEx participant and chat panel by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. You are welcome to submit written questions throughout the meeting, which will be addressed at the Q&A sessions of the meeting. To submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, then enter your question in the message box provided and send. Please note all audio connections are currently muted and this conference is being recorded. To ask a question via WebEx audio, please click the raise hand icon on your WebEx screen, which is located above the chat panel on the right, to place yourself in the question queue. If you are connected, to today's meeting via phone audio, please dial pound two on your telephone keypad to enter the question queue. If you require technical assistance, please send the chat to the event producer. With that, I will turn the webinar over to David Ferrio, Archivist of the United States. Sir, please go ahead. Thank you, Michelle. Greetings from the National Archives flagship building, which sits on the ancestral lands of the Nacogdoches peoples. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the sixth meeting of the 2020-2022 term of the Federal Freedom of Information Act Advisory Committee. And I'm pleased to welcome our newest member to the committee, Dion Stearns of the Federal Trade Commission, who I appointed last month to fill the vacancy created by the resignation of Lubna Haddad of the Defense Intelligence Agencies. Thank you to Lubna for serving on this fourth term of the committee. And thank you, Dion, for rolling up your sleeves for the last seven months of this term. The committee's charter notes that in addition to developing recommendations for improving FOIA administration, the committee also should develop recommendations for improving proactive disclosures. I understand that the technology committee is building on the work of the 2016 to 2018 term of the committee, which offered 11 types of records to prioritize for proactive posting. Here at the National Archives, we take seriously FOIA's mandate to proactively post records of general interest. You may have heard news in the last couple of weeks about the role of the National Archives with regard to presidential records and executive privilege, for instance. I invite you to visit um, the online National Archives FOIA, FOIA reading room at archives.gov which contains dozens of letters related to the request for presidential records by the House Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. Other selected re or records available on our website include records related to my task force on racism, which I convened in 2020 to recommend changes to, in support of an equitable environment for all National Archives customers, internal and external. Also on our website are FOIA logs, an employee locator, and an organizational phone list, among many other records frequently requested under FOIA. These postings set a great example for proactive disclosures across the government. Committee members, I look forward to hearing about the ideas you all have been shaping since the September 9th meeting on a range of FOIA matters, including FOIA funding, first party requests, the agency's use of the so-called Glomar response to neither confirm nor deny the existence of records. Today marks the eighth virtual meeting of the FOIA Advisory Committee, which last met in person on March 5th, 2020, when those of us in the William G. McGowan Theater here at the main archives building refrained from handshakes and used copious amounts of hand sanitizer. 21 months later, after the pandemic turned our world upside down, we continue to face uncertainty as to when we might meet again in person. For the time being, I wish you continued resilience as the days grow shorter between now and December 21st, and happy holidays with your families and loved ones. Finally, I, if you have not already watched the National Archives Foundation's recent, recent event with former FOIA Advisory Committee Margaret Cuoco, Discussing her book, Saving the Freedom of Information Act, I urge you to watch the National Archives YouTube channel. Longtime FOIA Advisory Committee Tom Sussman interviews Professor Quoka about the role 
that FOIA plays in fostering dramatic, democratic and dramatic accountability and transparency. I now turn the meeting over to Alina Simo. Thank you very much, David. Uh, good morning, everyone. As the Director of the Office of Government Information Services, OGIS, and this committee's chairperson, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the sixth meeting of the fourth term of the FOIA Advisory Committee. I hope everyone who's joining us today has been staying healthy, safe, and well. I want to welcome all of our committee members today uh, and express my continuing gratitude for your commitment to studying the FOIA landscape in order to develop recommendations for improving the FOIA process government-wide. Um, I especially want to welcome Dion Stearns of the Federal Trade Commission. As David noted in his welcoming remarks, he appointed last month, uh, he appointed mm -hmm. Dion last month to fill a vacancy created when Lubna Haddad of the Defense Intelligence Agency took on new work responsibilities and resigned from the committee. I, I do want to thank Lubna for her work on the committee and particularly her work on the classification subcommittee. Dion is Assistant General Counsel for Information at the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, whose headquarters sits right next to the National Archives flagship building in downtown Washington, DC. Prior to joining the FTC, Dion fulfilled a variety of FOIA and Privacy Act responsibilities at the Department of Justice's Executive Office for United States Attorneys, EOUSA, and the Office of Information Policy, OIP. Her experience ranges from processing FOIA requests to serving as agency counsel in FOIA litigation to training senior officials on FOIA. Dion is a graduate of Howard University and Catholic University's Columbus School of Law. Dion has already jumped into committee work by attending all four of the most recent subcommittee meetings. Dion, thank you for that. And she is deciding which subcommittee or subcommittees she will join. I told her there's no uh, limit. Welcome, Dion. We are very glad that you are here. I also want to welcome Thanks. our Thanks. I also want to welcome our colleagues and friends from the FOIA community and elsewhere who are watching us today, either via WebEx with or with a slight delay on NARA's YouTube channel. So some uh, housekeeping rules and announcements that we always go through at the beginning. Committee members, please wear, bear with me. Um, first, uh, I would like to introduce our fearless leader, the committee's designated federal officer, DFO, Kirsten Mitchell. Uh, Kirsten's going to help make sure that I stay on track today, as always. Kirsten has taken a visual roll call, confirms that we have a quorum. Uh, we expect Tuan Samahone to join us a bit later today. And I am advised that Tom Sussman will have to depart the meeting at approximately noon, but he may be able to call back in, so that would be lovely. A few words about public comments. Uh, we have received several written comment submissions in advance of today's meeting. We have reviewed all of them carefully and evaluated them prior to posting them to ensure they satisfy our posting policy for public comments, which is available on the FOIA Advisory Committee website. We have posted these public comments after remediating them to ensure they are compliant with Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. We have received so many public comments that we are still in the process of going through all of them. Even if there are any comments that we decide not to post, we will nevertheless share them with all committee members. And I want to specifically invite our committee members to review the public comments we have received thus far if you have not already done so. I also want to note that the chat function in WebEx or the NARA YouTube channel is not the proper forum to submit extensive public comments. You may submit public comments at any time by emailing us at FOIA-advisory-committee at NARA, N-A-R-A dot gov, G-O-V. And we will consider posting them to the OGIS website. The chat function on both platforms should be used to ask clarifying questions or provide brief comments or questions that we will consider reading out loud at the end of today's meeting. During our public comments period, we are particularly interested in soliciting feedback on the issues that the four subcommittees are currently considering. Committee members are interested in hearing your ideas and feedback so that they may integrate these into their internal discussions as they develop their recommendations for this committee term. I would like to briefly address one comment we received that we post a list of all attendees, government and non-government 
for our FOIA advisory committee meetings, just as we do for all chief FOIA officer council meetings. We have considered this request and have decided not to do so. The FOIA statute itself requires that detailed minutes of the chief FOIA officer council meetings be kept and contain a record of the persons present. There is no such statutory requirement on either FOIA or the Federal Advisory Committee Act under which this committee operates or the Government and Sunshine Act. Therefore, we will not be posting a list of meeting attendees, either government or non-government, for our FOIA Advisory Committee meetings. Meeting materials for this term, along with members' names, affiliations, and biographies are available on the committee's webpage. Click on the link for the 2020 through the 2022 FOIA Advisory Committee on the OGIS website. Please also visit our website today for our agenda. And regarding our agenda, today we have no outside speakers, nor do we know exactly how much time each agenda item might take, particularly with regard to some of the draft recommendations that we'll be discussing today. And as chairperson, I reserve the right to adjust the times as necessary. We will upload a transcript and video of this meeting as soon as they become available. A reminder that the FOIA Advisory Committee is not an appropriate venue for concerns about individual FOIA requests. If you need OGIS assistance, you may request it, but we ask that you not do so through our committee email. It is hard to believe that we've been meeting virtually for the last 21 months. While the virtual environment has allowed us, uh, our, uh, all of us as committee members to attend with greater ease, regardless of geographic location, uh, a big disadvantage for me and Kirsten is that we're not always able to see committee members raising their hands or leaning forward to ask a question or make a comment as we would if we were meeting in person. So I will be doing my best to monitor committee members' nonverbal cues, um, and we all need to be respectful of one another, try not to speak over each other, uh, although I know that's inevitable. But I also want to encourage committee members to use the all panelists option from the drop down menu in the chat function when you want to speak or ask a question. And uh, you can, um, I will call on you at that time, or you can also chat me or Kirsten directly via chat. As a reminder, however, in order to comply with the spirit and intent of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, Committee members, please keep any communications in the chat function to only housekeeping or procedural matters. No substantive comments should be made in the chat function as they will not be recorded in the transcript of this meeting. Um, another housekeeping reminder, if you need to take a break, please do not disconnect from audio video of the web event. Instead, just simply mute your, mute your microphone and close your camera. Um, and send a quick chat to me and Kirsten to let us know if you'll be gone for more than a few minutes and join us again as soon as you can. We have noted a 15 minute break at approximately 11.20 a.m. on our agenda. We may break a bit earlier or a bit later depending on our pace today. Uh, and just a reminder, I'm always guilty of this. Please remember to identify yourself by name and affiliation each time you speak. This will help us down the road with both the transcript and the minutes, both of which are required by the Federal Advisory Committee Act. So with all of that, uh, any questions? You've heard me give all these instructions before, so there should be no great surprises. Uh, I would like to turn my attention now to approving the minutes from our last meeting, uh, which was September 10th, 2021. Uh, Kirsten emailed committee members the minutes from that meeting. Um, I apologize, September 9th, not 10th. I misspoke. Under a 90 day deadline uh, laid out in the Federal Advisory Committee Act, uh, she and I certified the minutes to be true and correct and posted the minutes earlier this week. Uh, but committee members, if we missed anything, please let us know and we will make any corrections as necessary. So at this point, do I have a motion to approve the minutes unless I hear any objections from anyone? So moved. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Thank you. All right, um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Um, aye. All right, any objections? Okay, uh, minutes are passed and uh, they are posted on our website uh, for, um, for your viewing pleasure. Okay, any questions before we get started on the substantive part of our meeting today? Anyone have any 
concerns or um, questions that they want to ask before we get started. Okay, not hearing anyone. Um, if we could please move the slide deck, Michelle, um, to the next slide. Okay, so uh, first up today, uh, we always like to switch things up, keep everyone on their toes. Uh, the classification subcommittee, subcommittee is going to be presenting first. Um, Kristen Ellis and James Stoker are the classification subcommittee co-chairs. They've been hard at work. And I'm going to turn the floor over to James and Kristen. Thanks, Alina. Uh, this is Kristen Ellis. I am an attorney with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and I am a co-chair of the classification subcommittee with James Stoker, as Alina mentioned. And our other committee member, we are a very small committee, is Cal McClanahan. The focus of our work over the past year-ish uh, has been, it, well, a focus has been GLOMAR responses, particularly those issued in national security cases. A GLOMAR response is one where the agency neither confirms nor denies the existence of responsive records, because doing so would itself reveal some information that is exempt from disclosure under the FOIA. Um, while the FOIA statute itself does not contemplate a GLOMAR response, courts have recognized it as a legitimate response to a FOIA request under certain circumstances. However, there is some public skepticism about the use of GLOMAR responses. This may be driven in part by a lack of publicly available data about the use of GLOMAR responses, including the frequency and circumstances under which they may be issued. So the subcommittee has prepared a report that has been circulated, I believe, to the full committee making recommendations designed to improve transparency and understanding about the use of GLOMAR responses. Um, and James is actually going to go through those recommendations, but before I turn it over to him, I wanted to take a second to thank Kirsten Mitchell, Alina Simo, Krista Lemlin, and Bobby Talabian for their comments and input on the report, um, as well as my fellow committee members, Kel and James, for all the work that they've done uh, getting it together so we could present it to you today. This is James Stoker from Trinity Washington University. Um, thanks, Kristen, and thanks for all your work as well. Um, as, you, as you can imagine, this is a, a rather polarizing issue in, in some ways. While generally uh, both uh, members of government agencies and of the requester community recognize that uh, Colmar responses are legitimate and acceptable and appropriate under certain circumstances. There is a significant amount of skepticism from the requester community about the way that uh, they are used. And so our recommendations, which I'm going to go through now, are designed to um, try to get at uh, some of the, some of the um, sources uh, uh, in, uh, of this of this skepticism. So I'm going to go through the four recommendations uh, one by one. I think we have them on the slides. Is that correct? So if we could just go to the first recommendation. Okay, here it is. Uh, I would note this. I, I'm going to read uh, the, the text of the recommendations. Uh, some of them have been slightly paraphrased, I believe, uh, to fit on the slide. So I'll, I'll read out the full text of the recommendation as we've made it in our report. Uh, we recommend that, number one, we recommend that OIP issue guidance to government agencies that they use the internationally recognized nomenclature of neither confirm nor deny uh, in C in D to refer to GLOMAR responses. FOIA's purpose is to make the government more transparent and accountable to its citizens, and the use of terms of art or jargon can make this more difficult. Uh, we particularly think that the term GLOMAR itself is problematic. Why? Well, it refers to the name of a specific submarine involved in a court case. And the, that court case uh, originally had to deal with uh, exemption B1 related to national security. Now, however, uh, nowadays the GLOMAR uh, response is used in uh, in, um, in response to many different uh, types of uh, FOIA exemptions, including regarding privacy. And it's also spread beyond the federal level to state and local authorities. So GLOMAR, it, as a term, is 
uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat misleading. And that can act as a barrier for ordinary citizens and, and average requesters uh, who are not deeply steeped in the history of, of, of the FOIA. Uh, you know, the, the first question that anyone asks when they, when they hear this term Glomar is, well, what Glomar, what is that? And that requires a, a lengthy explanation. And our impression is that this can act as a, as a barrier to, to, um, to access, to, to basically um, to, uh, to, to, to res responding and reacting to, uh, to Glomar responses. We would note that in practice, the term neither confirm nor deny is used in many places, including in, in government documentation on the subject. So if you read through the uh, executive order on classification or uh, uh, Department of Justice and OIP guidance on the subject, usually in the text, uh, the term neither confirm nor deny is used. But the term Glomar uh, is also used from time to time, in particular in regards to uh, when, when referring to, to court cases. We feel that using the term neither confirm nor deny will help to uh, make the concept clearer to all involved. So our, we're going to our second recommendation now. If we can put it on the slide. We recommend that OIP require standardized tracking and reporting procedures for NC and D responses. That is Glomar responses. Uh, and I'm continuing here with our recommendation just to make this clear. Uh, government agencies should be required to track and report on an annual basis the total number of NCMD responses issued. Whether these NCMD responses were in whole or in part, the relevant FOIA exemptions that justify GLOMAR responses and the number of corresponding cases in which these were used. The number of NCMD responses that have not been affirmed on administrative appeal and the number of NC and D responses that have not been upheld in a court by a court in litigation. We also recommend that the Department of Justice should track and report on an annual basis aggregated data on NC and D responses as reported by agencies. Congress does not currently require government agencies to track and report the use of NC and D responses separately from other types of responses. Uh, rather, they are included generally uh, in full denials based on exemptions. At least this is what the Department of uh, Justice through OIP uh, recommends. They recommend that uh, NCMD responses be reported as full denials. However, our subcommittee was not able to ascertain whether all agencies follow this practice. Um, so there is a lack of data uh, out there about how often these uh, neither confirm nor deny responses are used. Certainly there is an impression that their use is increasing. Uh, there has been a, a term coined for this, so-called so -called Glomar creep, which, which uh, refers to the increasing use of neither confirm nor deny responses uh, in federal government, as well as it's spread to other branches of, of uh, uh, or, excuse me, to at least to, to other uh, agencies within government and to uh, the state and local level as well. Tracking data on the use of NCMD responses will help the public better understand trends in these area and their underlying causes. Now, to be meaningful, the data must be sorted and categorized. For instance, some agencies include a partial NCMD response uh, in response to every FOIA request. If you count this as a single NCMD response, it will inflate the number of Glomar responses that are actually being used. So for this reason, we believe that agencies should report FOIA data segregated by category, such as whether or not the NCMD response is full, full or partial. And then they should also sort uh, the number of NCMD responses by exemption. However, because we don't feel like we have a good handle on exactly how these responses are used across government, uh, we believe that uh, at least in the short term, agencies should be allowed a certain amount of leeway in how they report these responses. In other words, they should look at their own practices and figure out what the best way is to, uh, to report them. In recommendation number four, we recommend further investigation into the issue of Colmar responses, neither confirm nor deny responses. And uh, we suggest that this be one of the things that uh, the investigation look into as well. However, right now, the uh, subcommittee did not feel comfortable uh, going into too much detail about exactly how uh, these uh, responses should be, uh, should be tracked and reported. Uh, we have here on this slide um, 
some of the detail if you all would like to have a look at it about what we're asking government agencies to track and report right now. Uh, we do recommend that uh, the, the DOJ through uh, OIP uh, include NCMB responses in its annual summary of agency annual reports so that there is a, a picture of how this practice is conducted across government. We can move on to the next slide now. Our third recommendation uh, is that government agencies provide information to requesters on their websites regarding circumstances that will likely result in an NCMB response and where possible recommendations on how to avoid such a response. Uh, government agencies already have a duty to provide the public with information on how they implement the Freedom of Information Act. For instance, there are explicit requirements in place for government agency websites regarding the FOIA. However, government agencies are not currently required to include information regarding NCMB responses. Some agencies do this already. So for instance, if you go on the CIA website, there's a list of guidelines in its online FOIA reading room that includes several mentions of how they use neither confirm nor deny policies. However, there's not a general policy statement on how NCMB responses are used. For many other government agencies, there's no mention of this at all. So you could file a FOIA request and receive a neither confirm nor deny uh, response and um, be totally surprised by it or not have any awareness that this is a possible response. So we suggest the following guidelines for information be provided in the public. This is not in the text of the recommendation itself. This is in uh, the explanation of it, but it, uh, it, it, is, it provides some ideas of how agencies uh, could proceed. The agency should attempt to describe all circumstances that will likely result in an NCMD response with as much relevant detail as possible. The agency should advise requesters on how to avoid an NCMD response if possible. The information should be clearly written in plain language understandable to a non-expert. And we suggest that an ideal place for such a discussion is in the FOIA reference guide or handbook. We recognize that this will be challenging for agencies, and we can go into this in more detail uh, in the discussion. For instance, if, you're, uh, if, if your goal in using an NCMD response is to avoid revealing information about so-called sources and methods, you may not be able to go in a large amount of detail about what those sources and methods are, because that would actually reveal what the sources and methods are themselves. However, you may be able to discuss the practice uh, 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 in, in, to, to some degree. So we're not getting into too much detail here about what specifically agencies should be doing, but uh, the general uh, thrust of our recommendation is that they should be providing more information than they do now. Okay, we can go on to recommendation number four. Our final recommendation is that the Archivist of the United States direct a relevant organization, such as OGIS or the Information Security Oversight Office, or if necessary, recommend that a re relevant organization, such as the Government Accountability Office or the Intelligence Community Inspector General, first conduct a review of the use and practice of NCMD responses across government, and second, formulate a set of recommendations to ensure that these responses are being used in a manner consistent with the goals of the Freedom of Information Act. So um, as, uh, as my colleague, uh, uh, Chris may, may or may not uh, uh, mentioned, we did attempt as a committee to administer a questionnaire to uh, various agencies that we thought uh, frequently used uh, in CMD responses. And we particularly, uh, being the subcommittee on classification, we particularly targeted agencies that uh, we felt would be likely to use uh, neither confirm nor deny responses in, uh, in regards to uh, exception uh, 1B on national security. Uh, however, we only received responses from a very small subset of agencies that we sent the questionnaire to. I think, um, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I think we sent almost two dozen questionnaires out and we maybe received six responses and most of those responses were not full responses. Um, the reasons uh, for, you know, we, we speculate a little bit uh, in, in our report on the reasons for the lack of response. Um, we don't necessarily believe that all agencies were, were trying to avoid responding to our questionnaire, but uh, it, it did ask for quite a bit of data and data that they may not have had on hand. Um, 
But basically, this points to a, to a fundamental problem: is that uh, in order to make recommendations about uh, how to do uh, NCMB responses better, we need to have good information about how they are used at the present. Uh, now, the first two recommendations that we offered address this in part, but we think that um, a, another uh, agency with a professional staff and the relevant access, including security clearances, needs to investigate further how this uh, this works. We're asking that the investigation attempt to answer the following questions. What practices are currently in place across government for the use of neither confirm nor deny requests? How ha has the use of these responses expanded over time? And if so, are there any discernible causes for such expansion? I just want to note here that the expansion of the use of neither confirm nor deny um, responses doesn't necessarily indicate that there's a problem, but it might. And so we would like the uh, investigation to look into this further. Uh, what are the appropriate reporting practices regarding the use of these procedures? What categories should agencies use when reporting NCMD responses? What data would agencies themselves find useful to collect? And we offer this suggestion in particular because we believe that an investigation such as this could help agencies to better understand themselves how they track or better understand themselves how they use these uh, these responses. Under what circumstances do agencies issue NCMB responses without conducting an initial search for records? Uh, under what circumstances do agencies conduct an initial search of records before issuing an NCMB response? Based on the findings of this review, the investigatory body should make recommendations aimed at achieving the following goals. Ensuring that neither confirmed nor denied responses are being used in a manner consistent with the goals of the FOIA. Uh, implementing reporting requirements regarding the use of NCMD responses. Improving communication about NCMD responses with the public. Reducing the unnecessary and inappropriate use of the NCMD responses and ensuring that agencies only issue NCMD responses when conducting an initial search for records when absolutely necessary. The recommendations should be addressed to both the Congress and the executive branch. So those are our recommendations. Um, and at this time, we'd love to hear any feedback or questions from members of the, of, of the committee. Thank you very much. James, thank you very much. Great presentation. Um, a lot to think about, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to committee members to ask questions. Hey, this is Bobby. Um, first, I just want to say thanks so much, James and Kristen and, and Kel, for all uh, the great work you did on, on this and for sharing the, the white paper. I just had two comments uh, and then one question. So I, maybe I'll start with the comments and leave it at the, at the questions. Um, First, I, I want to say I do appreciate um, having more data on this topic, and that would be very, I, I can see how that, that would be helpful. Um, but I do want to push back just a little bit on agencies um, properly reporting on it um, with the current existing um, guidance. Um, the, as you know, we have comprehensive guidance to agencies on these reporting requirements, mm -hmm. um, and we do provide refresher training every year um, to the agencies that are um, managing these this data and reporting to us, and also agencies validate and we validate the data to make sure um, that is as accurate as possible. And in specific to this, for example, um, if we and we have seen, you know, in the other disposition uh, categories, an agency put in a Glomar response, we would go back to verify that that it should be a full denial. So I wanted to push back a little bit on data not being accurate. Um, but I, but that's that's you know separate of course from more data being um, helpful. Uh, second, as far as um, the conducting of a search, there are instances where the agency will know without having to conduct the search that the existence of a fact is exempt, uh, and that's where really Glomar comes. So I don't necessarily believe that not conducting a search when the agency knows mm -hmm. that the information is exempt, the existence of it is necessarily wrong, uh, mm -hmm. or it is wrong. I say that. Uh, and then final, my question as far as the first recommendation, I kind of hinted at uh, this, I think, one um, couple days ago. I, I'm interested to see were there examples that you saw, uh, or are there examples in, in where the agency is uh, describing the um, their withholding uh, as a GLOMAR without explaining that they're neither confirming or denying the existence based off an exemption? 
Um, of course, I, I understand um, that we don't want to use that type of nomenclature necessarily when responding to the public or in public um, uh, to requesters who are not familiar. Um, but I, 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 um, I, I'm not sure that the internal use of it by government agencies that have been using it for years um, has a significant impact. So I just wanted some where, where your thoughts were more on that, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you uh, so much, uh, Bobby. This is James Stoker again. If, if the other committee members uh, don't mind, I'll respond to at least uh, at least uh, some of that. Um, first off, let me say thank you for uh, for your comment on uh, reporting practices. It's great to hear that OIP is monitoring this carefully and, and verifying that government agencies are reporting this as um, as um, uh, the, the reporting of these as full denials, which is uh, what is recommended and I think required, as you said, by, by the DOJ. Um, it's good to know that it's being uh, being validated. Uh, we didn't, uh, we, I think that, that this concern was in part sparked by the lack of responses to our, our questionnaire. Um, but it also raises the question of how other types of uh, of GLOMARs are reported, for instance, partial GLOMARs, right? Are those reported as full denials if something is partially GLOMAR, but then responses are, are, um, are, but there is, a, you know, that some records are released even though it's partially GLOMAR. It, I think that the, there, there are big questions about how this works and how it's reported, and that's why we're asking for additional data. So the line between asking for additional data and current practices it can get a little, little blurry. Our goal with this recommendation, though, is ultimately not to criticize, but to think about how this could be conducted better. And so I think that we're we're on the same page there. Um, on conducting a search, is is not conducting a search necessarily wrong? Well, no, I don't think the, 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 the subcommittee is suggesting that not conducting a search is wrong in all circumstances. However, there is an impression, and this is one of those impressions that the uh, maybe the requester community has, it's difficult to, to validate empirically because we don't necessarily have data about this, but the impression is that it's much easier for a government agency to uh, use a uh, neither confirm nor deny response than to actually go through the effort of conducting a search. So if there, there may be an incentive to use this response. And we're not able to substantiate that in all cases, although I think that some members of the subcommittee might have personal experiences that they could share. Um, and I'm looking at one colleague in particular right now um, th that suggests that this might be the case. But uh, nonetheless, I, I think that uh, it is important to search a case. So there, there, are, there are reasons to, uh, to conduct a search that are beneficial, and I might let my colleague talk about that here in just a minute. Um, and then finally, on the first recommendation, you ask if there are specific examples of use of the term global in communications from from government. Uh, no, I don't think so. So if you look at response letters, for instance, I have not seen any that use the term GLOMAR, right? So it's true that there are not responses being sent directly to the public. However, agency websites do often mention the term uh, GLOMAR. So for instance, the uh, FOIA, uh, FOIA updates published by OIP, the OIP guidance on GLOMARization, um, those are using the term term GLOMAR, and those are documents that are intended, of course, for, for government use, but also for non-government use as well. Um, so we believe that standardizing the use of this term would be ultimately useful. I will say that within the subcommittee, there was, a, there, was there were initially some questions about whether or not uh, this recommendation would really make a large difference. And I would say that of the recommendations, recommendations we're making, this may be the least essential one. Uh, but I, I do believe that it will make things, uh, make it more useful, in part because it, it helps to demystify what's going on. I mean, one of the problems uh, philosophically, at least, in, at least from, from, from my perspective, is that we see the term like Glomar and it just it just seems so extraordinary. It seems out of the out of the ordinary. It seems like you know there's just something happening that we're just unable to comprehend, and uh, make makes it and, and for an average person not steeped in in uh, you know the case law or the, it, it may be a deterrent to, uh, to, to to say further appealing something or revising your request and proceeding further. Um, so using terminology that is more comprehensible is one step towards addressing that. I hope that 
response to your, your comments. And this is Kel. As the uh, aforementioned colleague that, that he was referring to, one of the reasons that, you know, this is the search thing is an issue is that, you know, if you file enough requests with the agencies that tend to do GLOMARs, you start to notice a few things. And one of the things that we're hoping that, you know, this data gathering would quantify so that we could decide, you know, is it just, you know, all the agencies hate me or is it that they, you know, do this as a blanket policy? Are these instances where you'll have agencies that just reflexively glomar anything about a particular topic? And for instance, that I'll give a hypothetical example. Let's say that OIP is, is one of these offices or, and that if I file an, um, if, if I file a, a, or I use FBI because OIP is too small. FBI is a big agency, they have a big FOIA office. This is the example I used when we were talking about it in the Senate committee. That if I file a FOIA request for all records about uh, Alina Simo, they will glomar it because whether or not they they have FBI records on her is a privacy matter. That is what a, I would argue a legitimate argument. However, if I file a glomar, if I file a FOIA request for all records about Christian Ellis, they will also glomar it because uh, giving the same exact form letter saying because it's a third party, you need this, this, and this, and they won't even bother to check that she is a known FBI person who is publicly known to associate with the FBI. They will just go, oh, third party, Glomar. So the, we're trying to narrow down, say, you know, if there are things, th there are these places where, and it's not just privacy, it's intelligence, it's sources and methods, it's uh, classification, if you do this enough, you see a lot of reflexive glomerization of things that if they are pushed, like if you go to court or if you appeal or something, they'll turn around and say, oh, sorry, here are some records we could give you. We didn't look for it because we glomered. But they don't do that until you push them to that point but we are having difficulty quantifying, is it just a couple agencies that do this or is this a widespread thing? And how do we make it so that those agencies don't do that? If there are established guidelines that if it is a third party request, you must search to see if there are any publicly uh, acknowledgeable records about that person before you glomar. You must do sort of the minimum due diligence as a FOIA officer before you assert we can either confirm or deny. Thanks, uh, Jay. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, Bobby, I'm sorry. I don't know if you have a follow-up question. Alan has gracefully been waiting. He has his hand up, but I want to allow you to ask any follow-up questions first. No, no, no follow-up questions. Just, uh, just a couple of uh, follow-up comments. Um, sure, sure. Consideration. Um, I, I understand. I, I'm going to just say that again, uh, reiterating that I think additional data, of course, is always good, uh, and I'm not pushing back on that at all. Um, and of course, in your example, Kel, I think you're talking about the application of the exemption not being accurate, not necessarily that um, a search had to be conducted to reach that conclusion. Um, but, you know, push me back a little bit. Again, data can be helpful in maybe um, this mystifying some of this. So I agree with that. Um, and then going back to the first recommendation, I appreciate the, the context. Um, I also, I think, side on not really necessarily agreeing with that recommendation because I don't think it's going to be impactful. Um, but I do strongly agree that when um, that it, even if glo the term Glomar is used, it should be used in connection with the neither confirm nor deny. Um, so thank you so much. Thanks, Bobby. Alan, you, you've been patiently waiting. Your turn. Thank you, Alina. Uh, this is Alan Bletstein from America Rising Corporation. I want to quickly commend the sub subcommittee members for a, a, a very informative and well-researched 
report. Uh, just a few quick comments. I, I think I, I agree with Bobby about recommendation one and and the the use of the term Glomar response. Uh, every practice area has its nomenclature, and I'm not sure that. Glomar is really that more problematic than the use of the term Vaughn index. Um, uh, you know, there aren't a lot of these expressions in, in, in FOIA, and this is a seminal case and a, and a, and a fun, entertaining uh, background with, with uh, Howard Hughes and a submarine, and, and, and I wouldn't want to, I'm not sure it's necessary to torpedo it, to use a bad pun. Um, you know, the, the, the public understands what Miranda rights are, um, you know, uh, Brady violations. Uh, I, I, I'd, I'd be sad to see this term phased out uh, as long as, like Bobby mentioned, there's the appropriate context. Um, uh, agencies and courts shouldn't assume that, that readers understand these expressions, uh, um, you know. Uh, and the government has no shortage of abbreviations and acronyms, and, and NCND doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. Um, and uh, you know, I understand that it's that it's used in Great Britain and some other countries, but uh, I don't think there's pressure. I, I, I don't think we should change our nomenclature to to. I mean, we should celebrate our differences. Uh, the rest of the world refers to. Football, when we use soccer, they use the metric system, and we don't. I, I, I just don't see that this is terribly problematic. I mean, I wouldn't die on this hill. Uh, you know, it wouldn't be the end of the world, but I'm not sure it'd be the end of the world if we dropped this recommendation either. Um, uh, other than that, uh, um, with respect to uh, recommendation two, 2A Roman numeral four and five, um, these seem to me, I'll defer to agency employees here, but uh, agencies don't track this information for any other exemption, and I'm not sure it's what warrants uh, special treatment for GLOMAR responses. Um, um, I'll leave it at that. And, and lastly, um, maybe this is just a concern about phraseology, but uh, I'm not sure agencies should be giving legal advice or strategic advice about how requesters can circumvent exemptions. Um, um, sure, uh, agencies should advise requesters that they can submit proof of death or, or, or a waiver or, you know, if there's an exemption 6 or 7C GLOMAR, but um, in terms of giving strategic advice, I'm not sure that's the agency's role. I'll, I'll end there. Thank you. So this is Kel. I'm going to I'm going to leave the last one alone because that's really wasn't my baby. James can talk more about mm -hmm. the the guidance, but the, to the idea of the two A five item that. And for, for those of you playing along at home who don't have the document, this is that the agency should rep report the number of uh, GLOMAR responses that have not been upheld by a court. And, and 2A4 is that have not been upheld on appeal. The reason that we put five in is it was originally a, a, a one part thing that said, you know, appeal or court. And we decided we needed to spread uh, separate that out into two, but the reason we were talking about court in general uh, in the first place was, you know, if this, there are two ways of looking at the current use of Glomar over the last 30 years. One is that it's just fine and it's just the right amount. The other is that it's being overused when it shouldn't be. And those of us who uh, adhere to sort of the first camp of, you know, it's fine, then yes, there's, there's, no, there's no real need for any more information about it being overturned because it's probably being overturned the exact right amount of time, uh, as low as possible. 
the those of us who believe that it is being overused, that it is being an issue that's being abused. And I I will be here to criticize. I mean, James said we weren't here to criticize. I'm here to criticize. <laughs> you know, uh, the if the Glomar system is being abused, and uh, we or anybody else ultimately asks for some form of reform of it, which would be the next step if the data supports our our uh, reasoning, then one of the things that we will have to grapple with is, well, you say it's being abused, but the agency says it's not, and who who are we members of Congress to sort of believe you over them? Whereas if we say it's being abused and it's being overturned a lot in court, then it's not just me, random person talking to Congress versus Bobby Talabian. It's me and five district court judges against Bobby Talabian. And so, uh, but on the other hand, if it turns out that it is not uh, being reversed a lot in court, that could support the argument that it is being used the right amount. It could also signal, based on the other data, uh, the possible outcome that, well, even if an objective viewpoint looking at this based on all the data we collected would say it's being overused it's still not being overturned in court well then that might mean that the court review uh needs to change that it needs the, the level of deference or the burden of proof or something like that needs to change if the court results aren't the same as you know our results or congress's results or whoever whoever studies this data so either way it's a point of data Nobody asks for information about how many times B3 has been overturned in litigation or B5 has been overturned in litigation or B7 has been overturned in litigation because those aren't uh, A, super hotly contested items uh, all the time and B, an instance where there is even less information than usual uh for people to to judge on glomar when you get to court many glomar declarations say we found that the fact of this and i'll use a specific example a, a cia declaration that i thought was remarkable and the court disagreed with me where the cia declaration said uh the fact of the existence or non-existence of responsive records is classified because it could reveal intelligence sources and methods. Intelligence sources and methods are such things as A, B, C, and D. And that was it. It did not say that this piece of information was A, B, C, or D. It just said uh, intelligence sources and methods are important. Here's four clear examples of low hanging fruit that everybody would agree with. Now give us Glomar. And the court said, okay, I trust you. Uh, that is problematic in some of these cases, especially when we later get more information that said that that wasn't exactly an accurate representation. So, and I wouldn't say that if we were investigating B5, we wouldn't say that they should probably do this as well. The reason we're asking for it for Glomar is because we happen to be looking at Glomar right now. You know, we might look at something else. There may be a trend and you know, now they have to report losses in litigation on all exemptions down the road. I don't know. I'm not sure that would be a good idea. I'm not sure it would be a bad idea. But we're talking about Glomar today, and that's the one that is in desperate need of more information about how it's being implemented both by the agencies and how it's being reviewed by the courts. That's my two cents. Hi, this is uh, this is Bobby again, and I, I want to thank Alan for his comments, uh, Kel for your response. Um, one thing as far as, and I, I wasn't looking into detail as far as line level of data that we would maybe want to collect on this topic. Um, I'm keeping an open mind, but as far as any data on litigation, that we already have. That's already freely available. You can pull that up. OIP reviews every case decision that's issued. 
Um, we provide summaries of those decisions by topic, Glomar being one of them, and they're all tagged. So you can search mm -hmm. and pull up all the cases where Glomar is an issue, see where the courts landed on that. So that that's not data that that's hidden to us. Mm -hmm. um, and you can use that for any exemption, not just Glomar uh, upholding or not upholding of Glomar's. Mm -hmm. Jason uh, had a had his hand up, had a question. Yes, um, Jason Dart, History Associates Incorporated. So, very interesting. Um, thanks, James, um, Kristen Kell. Very, very interesting um, 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 Care Act recommendation. I guess just one kind of um, historical comment, one futurist comment, and then I guess a, a question. Um, uh, James, you had mentioned that it was that Glomar is a submarine. It's actually the vessel, the exploration vessel, and it's it's Hughes. Obviously, mm -hmm. and the submarine was a Soviet submarine K-129. But I think that's important because we talk about language and and um, and the important of importance of you know how you describe things. And I would say that at least for me, um, who who's not you know I, I, I who's not as up to date or up to speed on the actual legal issue, I think that you know. The terminology, if, if you get a response as a requester and the, re, the response is neither confirm nor deny, that describes what's happened to you as a, as a customer, as someone that's put in a request and tried to get a response. So I think, you know, for me, that, that, that's the language that should be used. And, and again, that, that's as a commercial requester. I say that mm -hmm. as a commercial requester, someone who, you know, hasn't litigated. And then my second, the futurist question is, you know, um, Bobby, you mentioned that, you know, it's important, additional data is important. And I guess, you know, what's your recommendation, James, tell, um, Kristen, to how to get better information from the agencies? I assume when you sent your questionnaire, it was prefaced with the fact that, um, you know, you're a subcommittee, um, you know, you're working with OGIS. And, I, and I, I would say that, you know, I think in your in your draft, you said you sent the questionnaire to 23 people and only six responses. I mean, as, as again, um, I would say that's kind of disappointing of, of those that work inside the federal government to not actually um, uh, fill out the questionnaire and help in the process. So how, what would the suggestion be to a future uh, subcommittee or a future FOIA uh, committee, advisory committee on how to get better responses to help you, to help you actually build a better um, um, recommendation? Mm -hmm. Sorry, this is uh, this is James. I can respond to that unless somebody else wants to wants to take that. And if if I if I may, I'll just respond to sort of several several comments at once. I'll start with Jason, maybe, and then I'll go back to, to Alan, who makes some very good comments that uh, reserve a, that deserve a, a response. Um, so. Um, first, uh, you know, I'm a historian too, and so I thank you for the corrective on that. It was actually the the ship or the drilling platform that was looking for the submarine, and not the submarine itself. So that's certainly certainly true. Um, but I also agree with your comment that it should be described as a, as it is to the extent possible, and it is a neither confirm nor deny response. And that's why I prefer the uh, the topic. That's why I prefer that uh, that, that term. Um, Alan expressed, you know, an attachment to to the the, the name the Glomar and the story, and I, I do understand. I do understand that as a historian, I love I love stories. Um, but I think there's a kind of a dividing line here on how people feel that I, that I've observed when I've, when I've discussed the, the possibility of recommending a name change. It seems that uh, attorneys and litigators are particularly attached to this uh, this comment, in part because it's so often used in court cases, whereas others seem less attached to the cases or, or less attached to, 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 to the name, maybe because they're not dealing with the, the court documents around that. And so that could partially explain why some people are maybe prefer the, the, the name Glomar. Um, I, I just think it's easier to use uh, a simpler term where possible. And yes, you're absolutely right. We use terms like Miranda rights and others that are term, terms of art. Uh, but people have a good understanding of what Miranda rights are. I think if you look at pop culture, Miranda rights are everywhere. We have a good understanding of what they are. And while Glomar occasionally gets attention, I don't think that it has that same level of recognition as some of these other concepts. So I still think that there's a good argument for uh, for, for uh, recommending that, that one particular term be used, even if it's even even if I may not be able to convince other people of that. Uh, 
Jason also uh, noted that it was disappointing that only six agencies responded. Uh, we, we were disappointed too. Uh, we do, do also recognize that we were asking for a lot of data and we were asking for it on a short term turnaround period, but uh, you know, we, in, in a number of cases, we didn't even get a, get a response, a response to it. And in one case, one agency actually treated it as a FOIA request and basically, uh, so basically, we just assumed we were making a FOIA request and didn't even sort of you know, pay attention to the text that said who we are and what we were asking for. So yes, I agree that that, uh, that was disappointing. In recommendation number four, uh, we ask um, another government um, body to take over the investigation, um, you know, whether one under the National Archives or outside of the National Archives. And we note uh, particularly that we think it should be made mandatory. And I think that's the only way that you're going to get some agencies to respond to this is if you make it mandatory. And that's why to really get answers from, say, you know, some agencies in the intelligence sector, you may have to have the intelligence community inspector general. Uh, doing uh, doing the investigation because a request from them cannot be ignored or at least cannot be ignored uh, as as easily. So I hope that that, uh, that addresses that. Uh, finally, just briefly, uh, Alan noted that uh, we may or may not want to uh, be asking agencies to specify how to get around national uh, get, get around FOIA exemptions. I do understand that. I don't think that that's what we're asking for. I don't think we're, we're, we're asking agencies to help others to violate these exemptions. We're asking them to help people to get access to documents that they should have a legal right to, right? Um, so for instance, if uh, documents are unclassified, right? Uh, there, 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 there have to be ways of, of accessing them to make sure that they, they, they get done. Uh, I'm reminded of, uh, there's an article, um, on the CNN website recently about a request regarding James Brown uh, to the CIA. Basically, some some CNN uh, journalists seem to have filed a FOIA request with the CIA for any documents about uh, whether or not the agency conducted any surveillance on James Brown overseas, uh, you know, the singer. And uh, they they uh, Walmart basically, while also saying that they had conducted a search of unclassified records and they didn't find anything in their unclassified records, right? It was good that they did this search of their unclassified records, even while they felt that they needed to uh, glomar records about this, this individual in particular. Now, whether or not they should be releasing records or, or, or doing more of a search or what kind of search of the classified records they, they did, that's sort of, you know, another question. But the fact that they conducted a search of these unclassified records is, is something good and something to be, to be encouraged. I don't think that they treat all uh, requests for records about individuals in that manner, unfortunately. And so if there's a way that, an invest, that, that, that a requester can phrase their request to get a response that uh, involves a search for records that may possibly be released, agencies should be, should be advising about how to do that. And even more so in cases that don't uh, affect national security. So for privacy, uh, for instance, or um, law enforcement investigations, things like that. Uh, we're not asking agencies to help anyone to violate the ex exemption. We're asking them to help uh, get access to records that uh, requesters have um, a right to. And this is Kel. I can sort of back back up on some of that. So there, it's important here that we note that you know, even though we are the classification subcommittee, our recommendations are not for just Glomar for classification matters. You know, we're we're talking about Glomar usage period, and while everyone knows that Glomar is used for classified material and Glomar is used for privacy material. And it's also used for other things, but the the discrepancy often comes down to, for instance, uh, how much information is given about how a, how to satisfy the agency's need uh, to to not assert a GLOMAR uh, for different agents uh, for different exemptions. For instance, the FBI. As much as I bash on them a lot, they're pretty good about saying up front, we want you to give uh, proof of death, uh, privacy waiver, or uh, overriding public interest when you submit a third party request for records about somebody. You know, that's a B6, B7C thing. They're pretty good about giving that guidance. Uh, other agencies, 
are not always so good, or, and even FBI is not always so good when it comes to other exemptions. And I'll use sort of uh, what terminology you would use. For the longest time, and it still goes on in some agencies, but many intelligence agencies that will reflexively glomar a lot of things, uh, the dirty little secret is that they will glomar something automatically if you ask for records about a person. But they will not because the subjects of who we uh, surveil and who we are interested in, uh, if uh, 4.7 billion people filed FOIA requests, they'd be able to build a heat map of who we look at and what our intelligence priorities are. That's the argument that goes into the NSA, CIA, et cetera. But if you ask for records about an event that that person was at the middle of, they won't glomar it often. And that you can even, that this is something that they, they don't, I call it the dirty little secret, it's a poorly kept secret. I mean, they're, they're pretty open about it in many cases. And I've been in fact told by FOIA officers, just, just if you want to, one of my uh, cases, I was going for records about the former head of the German, uh, East German state police and secret police. And the agency basically told me, yeah, if you ask for records about this guy, we're going to glomar it because we will always glomar records for a guy. But if you ask for records about the fall of the Stasi on this day that he was in the middle of, then we'll give you records about that, or at least we'll conduct a search. So guidance like that, if an agency has a policy that we automatically reject things because of one reason or another, then their website should say, we have a policy of this, and here's the information you would need to give us in order for us to not trigger that policy. Okay. Tom Sussman uh, has a question or a comment. Uh, yeah. Uh, first, uh, I noticed in the chat early on, uh, one of the uh, uh, attendees, uh, Freddie Martinez, raised a question about whether there's any possibility of splitting out whether a Glomar uh, denial is based on B1, B3, B6, B7, uh, in terms of, you know, telling the uh, requester, because frankly, in my personal experience is you don't win uh, national security cases. Um, and that sort of then goes to the litigation issue, which Kel may have an insight on, which is um, a lot of, some of many of the cases where the court has challenged a Glomar response uh, result in zero documents anyway. Uh, and I, my impression is that most of that's in the national security area, maybe some in um, uh, law enforcement, but probably not much in privacy. Uh, but I just that was something that I wanted to sort of get the uh, the committee uh, uh, subcommittee members uh, sense out. I, I'll, I'll bite. I don't understand what the question is. Or if there was a question. Well, I think the, the, the first question was, does it make sense to require disclosure by the agency when it denies based on a Glomar response uh, exactly what um, uh, exemption it would be relying on uh, underneath so that it gives you some idea of whether it's worth challenging. I think this is Kristen at the FBI. I think it is already required, at least in litigation, you have to tie a GLOMAR to an exemption. Um, it might be that exemptions are grouped together, for instance, it, in most agencies that assert a national security GLOMAR usually will cite B1, B3 if they're protecting intelligence sources and methods information, since both exemptions cover that. Um, same thing with a law enforcement agency protecting privacy information. They're usually going to cite 6 and 7C. But GLOMAR doesn't exist on its own. GLOMAR is an assertion of an exemption. It's just a unique way of asserting an exemption. So if agencies are not doing that already, they absolutely should be. But it, it should, there shouldn't be a circumstance under which it's just cited without tying it to an exemption or yeah. more than one exemption. 
Absolutely. And I just want to just that that's that requirement is no different administratively than it is in litigation. Um, Michael Morrissey and Patricia West both have their hands up. Michael, do you want to go first? Uh, sure. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is Michael Morrissey uh, on the FOIA Advisory Committee. I work at MuckRock. Um, uh, I think there's there's I think this is a really helpful area to kind of dig into, and I really appreciate the the working groups. Um, efforts in this area. I do think that there's just immense confusion and uncertainty around Globemart, even by really experienced uh, requesters. Um, and I think, I think, as kind of mentioned, the agencies have actually seen this blow up in their face when uh, there is no actual document probably underlying there and, and somebody misinterprets it. And so I think improving that language is, I think, a, a really big opportunity, uh, both to make requesters' lives easier, but also to kind of help agencies actually uh, do their job with with minimal confusion among the public, and that's why my, one of my favorite pieces of this recommendation was just improving sort of the language and pointing to the CIA's um, documentation around how they use Glomar. I would love to see more agencies do that, not just on their their reading rooms, which I think a very small number of requesters actually use, but starting to put more of that language in the the response letter as well. Um, and while I agree with with Alan's point about the, the beauty of the Glomar moniker, and I'd hate to see that completely go away because I think it is an illustrative story. Um, one thing I did find is that agencies don't necessarily just say, oh, this is a Glomar rejection, but they will say, um, instead of neither confirm nor deny, they'll say um, any responsive documents would be exempt, so we're not going to search, or they'll use different, different phrases for that. And I do think that has an impact both on being able to research these issues as well as requesters being able to find resources. If you can Google neither confirm nor deny, you'll get some really helpful um, information. If you Google because any any non-public records responsive to your request would be categorically exempt from disclosure, um, you're probably going to get a lot fewer resources. And so I think pushing agencies to standardize how they um, address these exemptions, I think that would be worthwhile. And I think that is something that would make it easier to kind of understand this issue going forward and, and also help requesters uh, in the short term. Um, and then finally, and, and this might be, I'm on the, the process uh, subcommittee, uh, so this might be just our, our kind of process perspective on things, but I think we do ask agencies to do just this enormous number of, of reports, and I think that data is really helpful. I wonder if this is an opportunity to kind of look at, can we push, um, uh, agencies and particularly agencies uh, FOIA processing systems to um, release more bulk data so that rather than having to do all of these specialized reports, could we get more granular data about the number of exemptions that are applied on individual requests so that we can start seeing sort of, you know, maybe it's today it's Glomar, maybe tomorrow it's another issue, um, how often different agencies apply these and, and kind of do uh, more advanced analysis rather than just giving them another sort of aggregate report to develop um, and fill out going forward. But I, I do like the, the gist of these recommendations. I do really like standardizing some of the language and particularly uh, giving agencies um, backing and support and, and a little direction in terms of putting together more readable uh, plain language responses so that they can interpret what a Glomar is um, out of the gate. So. Thank you again, and um, I think this was a really, really helpful investigation, and I really do hope we get some of these recommendations passed into our uh, final final report and recommendation to the, um, yeah. Thanks, Michael. Um, Kel has been waving at me. I think he wants to respond to Michael. I just just one particular point, something that you raised that we didn't really discuss that that much, and it might be worth a future discussion. There is, and this is the, the lawyer and me talking, there there is a difference, a distinction between a categorical exemption and a glimmer response. And while I do definitely agree, now that you mention it, that this distinction needs to be made clear in a uh, in, a, in an administrative letter, in a response letter, uh, that is not what we're talking about here. And so in a categorical exemption, they're saying, we're not gonna search because we would withhold everything. In the Glomar, they say, even if we have nothing, telling you we have nothing would be a, 
would reveal that we were not watching Michael Morrissey on the day that he committed this heinous crime. And so that would reveal to him that he has been undetected and he can escape crime, can continue to escape crime. So it is uh, – to to a to a lay to a lay person to to sort of a normal non insane legal person they are very closely related and they may even seem indis indistinguishable but from a legal standpoint they are different but I agree that they should definitely uh, make clear that we are not issuing a glimmer response we're just saying this is a categorical exemption but that's sort of beyond the scope of this recommendation. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Joe. Uh, Patricia. You've been waiting so patiently. Uh, yes, thank you, um, Alina. Patricia Weft with uh, EPA. Um, first of all, I just want to thank uh, this subcommittee, um, James, um, Kirsten, and Cal. Um, this is, I can tell, a lot of thought, a lot of time and energy went into it, and it's really well thought out. Um, I do have to say, uh, when Alan was talking, I felt like he was reading my mind because I, I echo all of his comments. Um, for number one uh, recommendation, um, I, I don't see this as being that big of a problem. Um, if it were the type of thing where agencies were um, in their response letters saying, you know, I gloom are this uh, FOIA request, that would be one thing. But but agencies, well, in my experience, no agency does that. They usually say they neither confirm or deny, and will cite to the glow markets. So I I don't um, see that as being a problem. But but one suggestion I have um, is you might want to take this number one, and and maybe merge it with your third recommendation. Um, because I, I think that's a good recommendation, but it may get passed if you revise it. Um, and this is where you suggest that federal government agencies on their websites explain uh, what a GLOMAR response is. And I, I do think that's a really good idea. Um, you know, most agencies have a FOIA reference guide on their website and they explain the exemptions. I think it's a good idea to also explain what a GLOMAR response is, you can either confirm or deny, explain maybe a little bit about the GLOMAR case. But I think the way number three is written now, um, I, I, would, I would have concern about it getting past this subcommittee because you know, you might want to strike the language and, where possible, recommendations on how to avoid such a request, uh, such a response. Um, and, um, you know, I think, um, I, anyway, th these are just my suggestions. Um, for number two, where you're asking for information to be collected regarding neither confirm nor deny responses. Um, I echo uh, Alan's comments regarding uh, Roman numeral four and five. Um, regarding Roman numeral two and three, um, as somebody who's responsible for doing the annual report at EPA and also uh, formally at the National Labor Relations Board, I'm very familiar with our annual reports. Um, and spend a good chunk of uh, September, October, and November going over them. Uh, we're, we don't do this for the exemptions. So I, I'm not sure how collecting this information, Roman numeral two and three, for me to confirm or deny would be helpful. Um, and and lastly, um, the fourth recommendation um, that you have, uh, I, I love getting guidance from OGIS and DOJ on all things FOIA related. So um, I, I, think, I think that's always helpful. And uh, that is my two cents. So thank you for, for the time.
Thanks, Thanks very much, Matt. Uh, I wonder if somebody else could uh, could respond. I feel like I've been talking a lot um, this this particular meeting. Um, Crystal, would you like to respond? Well. Well, right, I, guess, I, I guess I could. So, uh, first off, uh, Patricia, thanks very much for, uh, for for those comments. I appreciate the attention you paid to the, the detail in in the report. Um, on number one, I I see how having an explanation on the agency website could be could be helpful. But the the response I might give to that, another way of approaching this, is that if it's if, it, if agencies are already doing this, if they're already using either confirm or deny, then it won't be much of an ask to ask them to, to use this term consistently, right? So if there won't, just won't be, be, be much, much, much to do, and that will really simplify things. Um, and it, then it also has the advantage, um, as Michael mentioned, of standardizing language across government. And I think that's the suggestion that Michael made is actually, it's, it's a good one. And it's actually one that we could maybe emphasize more in this recommendation if we were to uh, to revise it. I'm not sure if we're gonna take a vote or not today, but uh, we could certainly focus it a little bit more on this idea of standardizing the way that we talk about this. Um, so I, I, I do appreciate your comment, but, you know, if it's if it's not much of an ask, then it doesn't seem like something that would raise a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of, of, of objections. Um, on number two, I, I I do think it would be useful to track, you know, this more specific data about uh, neither confirm nor deny responses. So were they in whole or were they in part, right? Uh, because uh, like we said, there are many used many times this is used in conjunction with other types of responses. So it may be a full denial and then a partial Glomar, or it may be, you know, a release of some documents and then a partial uh, partial Glomar as well. And if we code them all the same way, uh, whether or not they're partial or full, they won't really have a good understanding of what is happening. Now we do recognize in this report that this is an ask for agencies. And we recognize in particular that it will require things like updating software systems, right? So you have your FOIA software and, you know, I don't know exactly how it works, but, uh, you know, I'm sure that somewhere there's a box to tick that says, you know, is this a full denial? Is it a rejection? Is it, uh, and, you know, somewhere in there, you'll probably have to add, uh, you know, the Glomar and maybe more than one option will have to be, have to be chosen. And this may differ from agency to agency. So we don't want to be too specific about how this will work on an information technology level. But but if we don't track uh, this this more granular data, we won't actually have a good sense of what's happening. So, so thanks very much. This is Kel. The one thing I will add is, and it's not necessarily about the, this recommendation, but about sort of all recommendations. Uh, but you know, it applies to this recommendation number four and five. Or sorry. Uh, yeah, item four and five. Patricia's Patricia's argument, uh, part of, part of it is, well, this isn't something we track, and I'm going to vastly oversimplify it. Uh, so, you know, obviously, no offense to Patricia, who I work with very closely in the legislation committee, but if we tracked it, we wouldn't need a recommendation. And the, I mean, my personal view of the role of this committee. In, in this recommendation and in all the other recommendations is to identify things that need to change and recommend that they change. The fact that you don't track this is sort of the thing we're identifying. We're saying we should track this. That these are these are things that should be tracked. These are things that should be reported. And to James's point, yes, this is going to impose a new burden on an agency, but the question is, is it an inappropriate burden and I think our position, at least mine, mine and James's position, uh, and probably Kristen's as well, but I can't speak for her, is that uh, it's not an inappropriate burden because of the need. You know, every agency burden has to be counterbalanced by the need for the burden. And in this case, we think that the need to be more clear on how Glomar is used and how often it is upheld outweighs the burden of now you have to report on something you didn't have to report on before. But that's just my thoughts on that. Okay. Um, 
I'm watching our time. It's 1130 already. So I'm very mindful of that. And it's been a really great discussion. I really don't mean to cut anyone off. I think Bobby wanted to just respond to something that Michael had said earlier. So, uh, Bobby, do you want to just yep, make I'll a quick comment? Really quick. Um, okay. Just to point out to Michael's comment, I appreciate the comments, Michael. Um, that in addition to the annual report, agencies post the raw data. So that, that's, the, I think, somewhat of the bulk data you're referencing. Um, line by line, every element of what goes to the report by request. Um, of course, that wouldn't include Glomar because that's not being captured in the annual report separately. And then just very quickly, I will say I did appreciate in the, the white paper that it was this reporting, additional potential reporting was not specifically tied necessarily at first or at all to the annual report. Um, and I think I'm considering, I'm keeping an open mind, um, uh, obviously the, this, this recommendation is aimed at, at OIP, um, that and in a lot of ways, what we do in the CFO report would maybe be a better vehicle to better understand, um, the need justified and, and burden as well as reporting as well. So I wanted to let you know that that was a thought of mine uh, and I appreciate that you had approached that and then appreciated the burden on agencies when coming up with this recommendation. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm gonna ask the subcommittee co-chairs. I know we've had a lot of discussion today. James and Kristen, are you ready to move forward with a vote today or do you want to absorb everything that's gone on today, review the transcript after the fact and re, um, and, and represent at the March 2022 meeting for a vote? What would you like to do? So I, this is James. Uh, I am open to uh, reviewing the, the many, many comments that uh, committee members had. We, we didn't hope for a vote today, but there have been so many comments that I think we need to at least cons consider them um, in, in a subcommittee meeting before we have a vote. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, all right, well, I'm gonna ask the technology subcommittee co-chairs, Allison and Jason, how much time do you all feel like you need to present? Trying to get a gauge on whether we should take a break now or maybe we could go another 15 minutes. Uh, I think take a break at around 11.45. I think 10, 15 minutes should be plenty. Jason, what do you think? Yeah, I think so as well. I hope we can keep it short. Okay, great. And I don't need to rush you. So if you need more time after the break, we can certainly do that too. Can you advance to the next slide, please? And another slide. And another slide. Okay, here we are. All right, Jason and Allison, you're on. I don't know who's presenting. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna present Jason Gart History Associates Incorporated. I'm gonna present this morning. Um, and Allison and I worked closely on um, just on our presentation. So we uh, the technology uh, subcommittee has continued to meet uh, every two weeks since our last meeting in September. Um, we've been working on uh, two recommendations for the full committee. Um, the first focuses on enhancements that agencies can make to their FOIA websites to facilitate a better experience for the request of the community. Um, this would build upon, this builds upon a, a, a recommendation from the prior terms advisory committee, specifically recommendation 2021, um, where OGIS will assess information about FOIA file filing process available on agency websites with the goal of informing further uh, o, uh, further OIP guidance on how agencies can improve the online descriptions of the process. Um, as as we, we discussed in, in September, we believe um, FOIA websites should include um, some, some baseline um, uh, uh, features, uh, a listing of the type of records maintained by the agency, but then also a, a listing of the type of records that they do not maintain. Um, we think they should be linked to, there should be links to agency uh, record schedules and any applicable capstone policies. Also some guidance or best practices for writing a FOIA request for the requester, for those that you know, might not be um, experienced doing so. Um, and possibly even with agency specific um, examples. And then uh, uh, some guidance or a description of the types of, of requests that would be considered overly burdensome by the agency or not sufficiently specific. Again, to help to help the requester do a submit a, a better better request. Um, 
we're certainly um, um, trying to balance these suggestions with the reality that each agency has different needs and um, that we don't want to prevent agencies from going above and beyond our, our own recommendations if they're too restrictive. Um, so one, one, one issue that, that's come up in the last three months is that, the, that our recommendations have been overtaken um, by recent events um, and you can, you know, overtaken or benefited, I guess, depending on how you see it, with the announcement that EPA will be retiring the FOIA online um, platform at the end of fiscal year 2023. Um, as a result, um, 20 agencies will be looking to transition to, to new systems. And we feel, the subcommittee feels that we're in a unique position to provide recommendations that, re that reflect both the interests of the community and the federal agencies in, in perhaps you know, uh, picking that new system. Um, and we will be uh, working on um, some suggestions to agencies or, you know, some guidance that we will then um, um, circulate to the, the broader um, uh, advisory committee on considerations of what, ty what, what type of um, new systems, what type of basic functionality considerations and what type of wish, wish items should be considered. Um, and then our thought is that this, this list of recommendations could then be used by the commercial developers, those in the commercial um, uh, software field, to help create or modify existing systems or even develop new ones to meet um, not just the needs of today, but the, need, the needs of the, of the future. Um, and ultimately here, and I, I think, you know, something we, we talked about before is that the goal here is that agencies should really keep the, the user experience, the requester experience, the customer experience, um, forefront in, in their websites, that, that we want it to be easy to use and we want, we want um, there to be information on there to help, you know, streamline the process to, um, um, to help, you know, to help work with the requesters to, um, to get materials released efficiently. Um, and then the, the second recommendation that we are focusing on is best practices for the release of uh, um, records in standardized ways. Again, this is something we discussed um, last time. You know, uh, again, the committee, the subcommittee, is is uh, investigating. You know, how uh, whether records should should be released in native format. Um, but we also understand that you know the need of classified national security records may require special protocols. Um, you know, and, and some of the issues that that we've discussed internally, and we will certainly be raising to you all, is that you know. With dealing with, it, with classified materials, agencies prefer flattened PDFs when releasing, so nothing in native format. Um, most agencies release emails, PowerPoints, and PDFs, although some do do Excel spreadsheets, um, just as is. Um, should emails be released um, or should be provided in PDF or just as plain text files? Um, you know, we, we think this is an important issue um, for both technology subcommittee and then the broader advisory committee because it hasn't been covered by prior committees. Um, we, we predict that this is going to be a bigger issue, especially as FOIA, FOIA agencies, for FOIA agencies, especially as our director federal agencies transition to a fully electronic environment in, in December 31st, 2022. Um, and again, this again picks up on the previous conversation that Allison and I raised about metadata and how critical it is and, and the feeling that um, you know, it should not be a stripped away unless absolutely necessary um, when materials are released. And, um, you know, we also look to our state level um, document releases um, for, for those that, you know, are in the portal or open records that um, you know, they do release metadata. So that, that's where things stand for the subcommittee. Um, I, asked, um, I asked right now Allison, AJ, uh, Kristen, Roger, did I miss anything? There's anything else we want to we want to raise or flag, um, David. And then um, I open it for other questions from from everyone. Thank you. Jason. I don't know if anyone else had a uh, interference. I didn't yeah. hear everything Jason said. Um, did anyone else have trouble hearing Jason? 
Yes, I think they're not. Thank you. Um, I can summarize uh, what we what Jason had said. So a lot of our original conversations within the subcommittee had been about what recommendations we would make to agencies to improve websites to best serve the requester community and also to help agencies if requesters are get told, okay, these are the types of records we're keeping for how long, these are the types of records that this agency does not keep and for minimizing unnecessary requests, that type of thing. But then with the uh, announcement by EPA that they're sunsetting the FOIA online system at the end of fiscal year 2023, I think it is, that that presented an opportunity for the technology subcommittee to work with uh, the requester community and the agencies to come up with suggested options for bare minimums for agencies to consider as well as some wish list items. And that could also be used by the tech, the software developers to meet those needs. And then we were also still uh, going back with one of the earlier recommendations to look at best practices for the way to possibly standardize the way documents are released, but also acknowledging that certain agencies have concerns about accidentally releasing uh, information that might be embedded that might not automatically come out if we were to release something natively. And then we were opening it up to the floor for other committee members if we had anything to add, or the subcommittee members if we've missed anything or committee conversation in general. Okay, great, thanks. Any uh, subcommittee members wanna add anything to the technology subcommittee's report? AJ's shaking his head no. Okay, um, anyone else have any questions for the technology subcommittee before we go to break? Going once, going twice. Well, we certainly look forward to your best practices recommendations. Um, perhaps you'll be ready to roll that out for prime time in March, so we'll see how that goes. Um, okay, so with that, I think we're ready to take a 15 minute break. Um, if we could try to keep it to 10, that would be really great. So we could try to get back on track, but um, maybe uh, as a compromise, we'll say 12 minutes, um, between 10 and 12 minutes. So let's take a break right now and uh, we'll be back soon. All right, thanks everyone.
right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We will be um, proceeding with the webinar. All right, hello, right, don't everyone. Don't forget to unmute yourself, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Sorry, I didn't mean to speak over you. Welcome back, everyone. Hopefully we have almost everyone back on camera, the committee members. Uh, we're going to switch things up a little bit from our agenda. I did advertise at the beginning of our meeting that we're going to keep things a little flexible. Um, I, and I have asked the process subcommittee to present next. Um, and legislation will go last, but definitely not least. So um, with that, I am going to turn it over to uh, subcommittee co-chairs, Michael Morrissey and Alexis Graves. All right, perfect. Um, good morning, everyone. I am Alexis Graves, uh, the director for the Office of Information Affairs at USDA. I am the co-chair of the process subcommittee along with my um, esteemed colleague, Michael Morrissey, um, and also a member of the first person FOIA working group. I am just so very excited to share with you guys the work, the recommendations um, crafted by our first person FOIA working group, which was led by our colleague Roger. Um, other working members included Tuan, who so graciously compiled, um, you know, the team's thoughts and notes and pinned the recommendations circulated. Um, and finally, but certainly not least, um, we cannot forget our resident FOIA guru, um, Tom Sussman. Um, I want to start. Uh, First, with acknowledging and thanking all of the agencies and the advocacy groups um, that really provided their insight about their handling of and their challenges with first person access requests. Um, we very much appreciate their time, attention to this issue, and as always, um, you know, their feedback. Uh, we very much look forward to continued work with all of these groups. Um, I also want to thank former advisory committee member, um, professor, and uh, author. Uh, Margaret Quoka, whose uh, work really served as the framework for the recommendations being presented today. Um, I think most of us at this point in the committee uh, are familiar with Margaret's work and the phenomenal job um, she's really done with highlighting how FOIA, uh, as she says, it can suffer under the weight of its uh, unintended uses. And so as an example of this, as many of you know, um, there's no discovery process, right, in the immigration court system as there is with the federal district court system. Um, so a lot of times immigration lawyers um, use FOIA to retrieve those records needed to defend their clients. Um, and so with that, it should be no surprise that our recommendation for discussion today um, builds upon that one previously set by the 2018 to 2020 term. Um, and in that, um, just so you guys have a little bit of context, uh, that one recommended that OGIS and uh, the Department of Justice Office of Information Policy um, identify those records frequently requested under the FOIA and or Privacy Acts by or on behalf of individuals seeking access records about themselves for the purpose of establishing alternative processes for access. Um, we really saw this um, initial recommendation um, really advancing or, or achieving really two important objectives. First and foremost, um, we thought that it would ensure the timely processing of records that involves, uh, you know, one's life and liberty as well as their property interests. But secondly, uh, it could also help uh, aid some of our agencies in freeing up some very, very limited resources as well. Our um, working group uh, saw this recommendation really as an excellent start, um, really kind of that springboard to address the access issue. Um, but we did also feel that it looked at it from the 60,000 foot view, right? Um, so this term, we wanted to give this issue a little bit more life. Uh, we wanted to do a bit of a deeper dive and put forward some specific recommendations. Um, and so as a starting point, just so you guys have a little bit of background, a little bit of context, um, we surveyed a few of the agencies identified by Professor Quoka um, as really having large number of these uh, first person FOIA requests, as well as those requesters um, who, you know, routinely conduct business with those agencies. And so um, this included the Internal Revenue Service, um, the Social Security Administration, um, entities within the Department of Homeland Security, um, you know, specifically uh, the United States Citizenship, I want to make sure I get the acronym correct, and Immigration Services, USCIS, um, and then, of course, a component within the Department of Justice known as the Executive Office uh, for Immigration Review, and they go by the acronym EOR. Um, we were, like, very, very pleased to learn that some of these agencies have already taken um, significant steps to kind of provide alternatives to filing FOIA requests 
um, to facilitate prompt access to some of these more frequently requested first person records. Um, and just so you guys have some examples of that, um, the IRS, we learned, uh, has created this tax transcript, which is essentially, um, you know, this summary document of tax information relating to a taxpayer's um, filings. And so um, this was a huge time and cost savings for IRS's FOIA program, um, as they no longer had to search for multiple records across multiple repositories to respond to these requests. Um, essentially, this singular report, um, you know, encapsulated virtually everything and is, is now also conveniently available to the public uh, via a search, uh, excuse me, a self-service uh, online account. Um, another really great example uh, was from our own uh, committee member, Linda Fry um, from the Social Security Administration. Um, Linda had shared with us that SSA receives a large number of access requests from folks seeking their applications, um, you know, for social security cards, claims files, genealogical information, um, and so a lot of these requests are flagged upon receipt and then they're sent to this cadre or a, a special team of agency workers that aids the SSA um, disclosure team with processing on a part-time basis. Um, this cadre is trained by skilled disclosure analysts um, and their work is also reviewed by um, the trained analysts once it's completed. Um, so just kudos to IRS and SSA for their uh, proactive uh, action in handling these first person um, access requests. And so. Switching gears um, in our review of our agencies, uh, our team also found some opportunities for growth. And so, um, again, I want to thank uh, both USCIS and also EOR for sharing insight um, on their processes for handling their, their first person requests. Um, and so, within USCIS, uh, the A files uh, were identified as a record uh, that should have some alternative access outside of FOIA. Um, and for those who may be unfamiliar with the A file, essentially it's a collection of records. Um, you know, maintain on a person that uh, documents the person's immigration history. Um, they're usually uh, created when an application or a petition um, for a long-term or a permanent benefit is received or, you know, when there is some type of enforcement action um, initiated. Um, USCIS, they shared with us that they understand, uh, you know, the importance of the timely processing of these A files, uh, and they certainly understand that the delays uh, really have in, in processing really have grave consequences. Um, and so they advise that they have made uh, significant progress on their backlog of these A files since the filing of a 2019 class action uh, by several immigration advocacy groups. Um, in this suit, there was an allegation of, um, you know, routine violations of the FOIA statutory timeline. Um, in that case, um, you know, the court opined that, you know, the failure uh, to timely process really undermines the fairness of immigration proceedings, uh, particularly for the vast number of, of uh, non-citizens navigating the immigration system. And so the court did ultimately order an injunctive release um, against USCIS, um, permanently enjoining it, um, you know, from failing to adhere to the uh, FOIA statutory deadlines uh, for adjudicating these A-file requests. Um, and so USCIS was required to submit recurring compliance reports to document their progress with the A-file backlog. Um, I am pleased to report that in their most recent compliance report, USCIS advised that it had reduced its A-file backlog from 21,987 down to 244. So that's really a really huge victory for that team. Um, I wanna ensure that our colleagues and also my colleagues um, on this, this working group uh, that USCIS continues down this path of success, we want them to win. So um, we did ask that they reconsider implementing a alternative to first person access request. Um, you know, our thought was that while, um, you know, the class action addressed specific individuals with like liberty interests, um, it will most likely end up delaying those records requests of broader public concern, um, you know, for which the FOIA was intended. Um, USCIS did advise that there would be challenges in identifying an alternative, um, specifically if not being processed by the FOIA team, then, you know, you know, they couldn't come up with another other uh, viable option. And so, um, again, we look forward to continued discussions with USCIS. Uh, we see them as valuable partners uh, with respect to the crafting of these recommendations. Um, another agency that we had the pleasure of speaking with was EOR. Um, again, uh, they receive about 48,000 um, to about 60,000 requests annually, and about approximately 95% of these requests 
uh, seek records um, of proceedings. They're known as ROPs um, of respondents before immigration judges. Um, you know, these ROPs really kind of include everything under the sun, um, you know, hearing notices, uh, applications for relief, exhibits, motions, briefs, hearing tapes, um, and then, of course, orders and decisions of the judge. So, um, just a lot of very, very valuable information in these ROPs. Um, traditionally, uh, these ROPs were kind of, you know, uh, housed in paper and all across the country, uh, which, as many of you guys know, who are processing FOIA day in, day out, uh, you know, making retrieval quite a challenge. Um, our team was really, really pleased to hear that EOR, with some of its uh, partners, were already well underway um, rolling out an electronic system uh, known by the acronym of ECAS, and this system um, is, is set up to uh, essentially access and, um, you know, manage and store and transfer ROPs electronically um, and permit uh, self-service access to um, you know, DHS and also uh, representatives of non-citizens in proceedings um, before EOR. Um, ECAS will unfortunately not be made available to the 46% of respondents going pro se. Um, you know, these individuals will uh, need to continue to submit FOIA requests uh, through, through EOR. So, um, again, just wanted to give you guys a little bit of context and a little bit of information about the work that we've been doing um, let's go ahead and dive into the recommendations. Um, and so I think recommendation one is, is fairly straightforward, um, but I will go ahead and just read it. Um, they are records relied on uh, by an agency that affects eligibility for benefits or adversely affects an individual in proceedings should be made automatically available and not require first person of FOIA practice. And so I will just say with that, you know, while many of these individuals at stake here, um, may not have formal due process claims, um, you know, to broader access right, um, forcing these individuals to resort to FOIA kind of really undermines due process and fair proceedings, um, as well as making accurate agency um, determinations. Um, with respect to recommendation two, um, record access should not discriminate against pro se parties. Um, we certainly understand that it's not advantageous to push one in the direction of, of moving pro se um, for anyone, <laughs> lawyers included, it can be a challenge to really kind of, um, you know, navigate that legal system right, um, particularly when your first language may not be English. Um, but the reality is, as I explained before, we have about 46% um, of folks uh, and for a whole host of reasons going pro se. Um, and so we need to come up with a solution to accommodate this larger class of respondents. Um, you know, maybe some of them are thinking about seeking counsel, um, but maybe they need some underlying paperwork um, you know, before the attorney decides whether or not to take on their case. Um, again, we certainly don't want to compound this issue. Um, and so that is that is kind of our rationale for recommendation number two. Recommendation number three, agencies should use technology to leverage their effort uh, to make first person agency requests more easily accessible outside of the FOIA. Um, IRS and EOR, as I had just described, are both um, you know, really great examples of how technology can really positively change um, the trajectory of a program. And so that, for that reason, we applaud them both um, for making and supporting the investment and demonstrating to their colleagues and peers and their agencies and partnering agencies that, you know, um, you know these types of initiatives really do have um, a huge return on investment. Um, as we are all being directed to, um, you know, move toward a completely digital infrastructure with the um, OMB and NARA mandate in 1921. Uh, we really want to urge uh, agencies to think about how to really capitalize on technology to make the retrieval of records for this first person agency records um, more accessible to all. Um, recommendation number four, um, agencies that receive frequent first person requests can benefit from identifying the most commonly requested records and developing procedures for processing such records to promote efficiency and good, um, you know, customer service. Um, with all of the agencies we discussed today, it's clear that they've all really assessed their cue to identify those frequently requested first person requests. Um, it's also really clear that they understand the correlation between um, expeditiously processing these requests and also um, customer satisfaction. I think, um, you know, what is really inspiring though, um, with the group surveys is that you can really come up with solutions and procedures to kind of effectuate change and better serve customers 
um, that aren't necessarily so crazy expensive, right? I think SSA was a, a, a perfect example of that. I just think that it requires all of us to kind of dig deep, um, be creative in our thinking and, 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 you know, again, go outside the box. Um, with recommendation number five, um, other agencies that receive uh, fre frequent first person requests uh, should consider the costs and benefits of moving to proactive systems for disclosure, um, such as that modeled by other agencies, such as the IRS and SSA. Um, and so there were other agencies identified, Professor Quoka, um, you know, where first person requesters routinely request records under the FOIA that. Um, do relate to eligibility for benefits. And, and so two of those were the uh, Veterans Health Administration as well as um, the Federal um, Emergency Management um, Administration, FEMA. And so agencies like these really should consider doing some, um, you know, cost benefit analysis of moving toward an electronic system um, that, that would essentially allow for easier access to the records. Um, so that is, that is our recommendations. I wanna make sure that I open it um, to uh, my colleagues if they have any additional comments about these recommendations. And then I think we may have some specific comments, correct, um, Alina, about these from some of the agencies that we partnered with. Yes. yes. Perfect. James has his hand up, but he's the first person I see. And Bobby has his hand up too. James, go first, Bobby next. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Alexis, for this presentation and for all the other members of the subcommittee for their uh, work on this report. It, it seems like an excellent report. You all have done extensive research, and it's nice to, you know, see a document that has so much uh, so much work that's gone into that. Well, speaking from the perspective of the subcommittee on classification that just did a project on Glomar, I wish we had the <laughs> kind of access that you all have seen seem seem to have gotten. Uh, I was one of the drafters of this uh, this recommendation based, of course, on, on the work of Professor Fuka, and I'm really thrilled to see you all taking it further, following up on it so quickly and developing it in specific manners. Um, I, I just had a couple of comments about the uh, about the recommendations. I noticed the recommendation section is much shorter than the analysis, which is not necessarily a problem, and maybe you're still in the process of developing it, but I, I think that a couple of the recommendations could uh, really benefit from a bit more detail, um, particularly recommendation number two, where you talk about how record access should not discriminate against uh, pro se parties. Um, most of the of the content about the record of the recommendation itself seems to focus on, you know, the practices of EOR. And while that's a good example, it might be good to be a bit more specific about how re record access would not be discriminating against pro se parties. Is it, you know, making uh, online forms that are easy to deal with, that clearly outline the cost structure? Is it, um, you know, what what is it exactly? Is it, uh, is it, you know, having a presence outside of the agency beyond just like a website interface. Uh, in other words, how do, how do um, agencies go about making it easier to people that are, you know, representing themselves and not relying on uh, on counsel, right? And I think a basic principle of freedom of information access should be that you, you should not have to have an attorney in order to get access to that information, right? So the more detail you can go into there, the more suggestions you can offer, the better. And then on recommendation uh, number four, uh, the phrasing of the recommendation struck me as interesting. You say that agencies that receive first, in, first person requests can, uh, can benefit from um, um, identifying the most commonly requested records and developing processes for processing such records to promote efficiency and good customer service. So that struck me more as like a best practice than a, than a recommendation. And while that's not necessarily a problem, I think if you're going to make a recommendation, it, uh, it, it, it might need to be a bit stronger. So you might have to say agencies that receive first person requests should benefit or should identify the most commonly requested records. This of course was the original, uh, the original recommendation from the 2018-2020 term itself that they should identify those most common records and then create new uh, new means of uh, for, for accessing them. So in a sense, it, it's either a best practice or it kind of repeats what the original recommendation was. So that one may need a bit more attention as well. Uh, but um, again, I really love the direction in which this is going and congratulate you all on the great work. Thank you. Thank you, James, and thank you for uh, both of those uh, recommendations. We will definitely keep those under consideration. Great, thanks. Uh, Bobby. 
you had your hand up. Thank you. Thank you, um, Alexis, um, for the wonderful presentation of and all the work of the subcommittee. I really appreciate it. Um, the one thing I, I want to note is uh, there's no question that having this information timely provided, it's, it's important information for uh, and, and serves a really crucial purpose and timely disclosure of that to the individual is, 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 is something that we all want. Um, but I think it would be beneficial to the recommendations in the white paper to address some of the challenges. Um, and the, you know, for some of these, you know, no matter what, the records are gonna require some level of review for sensitivities, <clears throat> whether that be um, FOIA professionals or whether it be, you know, whether we're saying we're taking out a FOIA and it's still gonna be FOIA professionals. Um, so there's resources, I'm sure there. Uh, and there's other challenges. I, I don't think the agencies are not wanting to reduce the burden, provide these timely and, and reduce the burden on themselves. So I think in order for the recommendations to be you know, helpful to um, the purpose it's trying to serve, I think the challenges should really be analyzed, addressed. Um, and I really do appreciate the last recommendation as far as a uh, cost benefit analysis. I think that's really helpful because um, of course, you want to provide this information in the mo least uh, taxpayer expensive way, mo in the most efficient way. Uh, and I would agree with James that I, I did find this recommendation number four a little bit redundant to the prior uh, recommendation uh, that identified commonly requested um, records I, I, it, that we fulfilled. Um, thank you again, and I hope that's helpful. No, that's very helpful, and uh, I think some of the agencies probably agree with you that we should talk a little bit more about the challenges, and so um, definitely, certainly, we will, you know, reconvene and talk about this. I think that's an excellent point. Um, Alan Bloodstein has his hand up. Or is that from earlier, Alan? Yes, no, thank you, Alina. Um, Alan sure. Bloodstein, America Rising Corporation. Uh, I join um, James and Bobby in amending the... Uh, the group for its work here and, and the fact finding is very impressive. Uh, a few comments on the recommendations as well. Um, recommendation five seems to be swallowed up by one. I wonder if it's an alternative recommendation. If, if recommendation one passes, I don't know that five is necessary. If you're confining five to agencies that um, uh, provide uh, benefits to the public. Um, because recommendation one appears to mandate um, agencies to make proactive disclosures as opposed to just doing a cost benefit analysis. And, and more on recommendation one, um, you know, I think I'd be more comfortable if we were making recommendations to specific agencies, especially with the ones you've discussed. This one is sweeping across the government. I, I don't know that. I'm not sure some of these terms are, are quite broad and, and vague. Uh, I don't know what a, is meant by a proceeding, uh, administrative, civil, I mean, uh, law enforcement. Uh, I don't know that the hundreds of agencies are even going to know that this applies to them. And um, and and benefits as well, I mean, I, I, I don't. I, all financial benefits, uh, I, I just don't know what the scope of this is, it seems to be go well beyond the, the, the few agencies that, that you've discussed. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. I, I do appreciate that. Um, and, and in any of the uh, working group members, if you have any comments, please, I, you know, <laughs> about the specific recommendations or any of the uh, wonderful comments we're receiving from our committee members. I see Patricia West had her hand up. Was that for again from earlier, Patricia, or is this a new hand up? This is a new hand up. Great. Uh, uh, Patricia West from uh, EPA. Um, again, want to compliment the, the entire working group for all their work that they've done. Um, this is something that is um, near and dear to my heart. Um, I, I'm just going to make one suggestion that that I've noticed, um, and I, and um, one thought could be um, because in 
recommendation um, recommendation uh, D that you have. Um, you talk about um, processes, different processes for um, processing records. Um, one thought I'm just going to share broadly is that um, a lot of agencies can release records um, in their proceedings if they were to change their regulations. Um, I, I've seen a, a lot of um, agencies require first party requesters to go through the FOIA process instead of um, having being able to receive the records in the particular proceeding that they're in. So that's just um, just a thought I thought to, to share with the working group. Thanks. Thank you, Patricia. Patricia. All right, any other committee members have any comments? Uh, I see, oh, Allison just raised her hand. Yep. Um, one thought is, has uh, the subcommittee looked at the impact of the Cases Act, which requires agencies to have certain information requests be submitted electronically? I, I didn't see anything in the recommendations, but I'm, and I'm not sure how much it would impact, but maybe something just to say to also further uh, expedite this or facilitate it that these requests can be, should be done electronically and not mailing in a, a form. That's all. No, I think that's that's really helpful, Allison. Um, I know that there was a, a very small conversation about that, but I think we should definitely revisit that. Great, thanks. Okay, I see Michael Morrissey has his hand up. Michael, go um, ahead. I was not involved in the, the specific drafting of these recommendations, and so I can't take any credit for the, the wonderful work that went in here. But I do want to say in terms of the, the differences between draft recommendation one and five, I think one of the things that um, I kind of see is that a lot of the problems with FOIA kind of start way before the FOIA offices. And I think one of the hopes that I had and one of the reasons I was excited about that recommendation is, is forcing agencies to sort of stay, oh, our FOIA budget's huge, you know, let's like kind of squeeze that. Uh, but then also look at, oh, you could spend a lot less money on this if you actually build out the systems to allow this proactive disclosure. So I think both pushing on those rights and then pushing on some mechanisms to get agencies to kind of fix things upstream. And I think that's that's one of the real challenges, I think, throughout the FOIA process is how many things are broken before they get to the, the FOIA process itself. Um, and there's it just that's a really hard problem to fix the the rest of everything going on in, in the, uh, the the system. So um, I think regarding the cases act, I think one of the, the really great discussions we had earlier was was talking um, with with some agency teams that are working on creating better form systems and better electronic submissions and standardizing that process across the federal government. And I think just getting more things in a standardized way and, and making sure that this data is segregated up front whenever possible um, would be really, really helpful. And to, to Bobby's point about sort of sometimes there's going to be reviews where you do have to disaggregate this data. That's true. I also think that, um, you know, this has been a known issue for a long time. And I think we asked, you know, it, you know, under GDPR, every tech company in the world allows people to export all of their data. Um, and they found ways to kind of uncommingle this stuff um, within a very short period of time after those laws were passed. Uh, and I think the federal government has had the FOIA laws for, for quite some time now, um, making sure that we're, we're making this data easy to export and making sure that, you know, when we develop systems that are going to impact these rights from the beginning, we don't say, oh, we're surprised that we're now getting FOIA requests for this. but find ways to do proactive disclosure. And I think that's that's the public's expectations. And I think it's it's not the FOIA office's fault that we haven't gotten there when it comes to uh, first party requests, um, but it is it is a problem. And I think the government, I, mean, I think the public should expect more at this point of if you're trying to get immigration files, if you're trying to get your own IRS files um, for the government to say, oh, there might be sensitive stuff in there. We're gonna have to take a year or months and months to get it back to you. Um, I think is is a pretty bad excuse in, in 2021. Thank you, Michael. 
We've got lots of stuff to take back to the layer here. <laughs> yeah, I see Kel has his hand up. Kel, can you promise to make it quick? I'll try. Uh, <laughs> it's not really super quick because it's, it's sort of two points, but it's something that uh, when we're doing, when we're talking about setting up new processes, I think that, you know, it's very important to ensure that whatever process is set up for an agency, whether it be, you know, regards to the agency, uh, have at least the same informational guarantees as FOIA and at least the same rights. Because what we don't want to see happen is what happens a lot. For instance, uh, you can go and request your file from some uh, OIGs without a FOIA request. You can just say, I'm involved, I, I am the target of this investigation, I will, or I am the complainant, I want a copy of the file. And you can sometimes get that, and it will, the redactions in there will differ wildly from what you would get if you filed a FOIA request for it. And often they would redact things that, you know, you can't withhold under FOIA. And they'll say, well, you can't go to court to get information. So if there is any mechanism for withholding of information, any process for first party requests must give the same limitations on exemptions and same appeal rights and same court rights as FOIA or else you're taking a step backwards. And the second thing to the point of the person who said, you know, there, some people treat it as a FOIA request. Uh, this happens a lot with consultations as well. Even if you have an agency that has an alternative method, for instance, you're doing a security clearance appeal, you're entitled to your investigative file by just asking for it and the agency is supposed to give it to you. Even if you have an agency that does that, if they find a record that say belongs to ICE, they will refer that document over to ICE and ICE will treat it as a FOIA request. So this can't just be the agencies that get first party requests. There must be a guarantee that if I as an agency have a first party request system, then I'm either going to process other agency equities through that system or it must guarantee that other agencies that I do refer things out to also treat it differently or else you're going to end up with this sort of quagmire where you're still stuck in FOIA, even though the agency you're dealing with is actually doing it right because everybody else isn't. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Joe. I, I just wanted to, I appreciate Michael, your comments. I just wanted to say that I was not framing as an excuse. Um, and I, I think, you know, I want to say, you know, obviously, what you would describe is what we all want. Um, but I just want to emphasize that for this to be helpful as a recommendation, it's something that agencies take action on. That addressing the challenges that they face, I think is really important. Um, so getting to the solutions. Um, so I think that just needs to be a part of this process. So I just want to make sure that it wasn't not necessarily framed as an excuse at all. No, and I, I didn't mean to apply that you were making excuses. I think, um, I think, I do, and I think everybody on the, the committee does really understand those challenges. Um, you know, I also, you know, make sure that we're kind of, you know, and, and also I think, again, this isn't sort of a problem with the FOIA offices. This isn't a problem with the FOIA personnel and, and you know, FOIA programs. This is a problem with sort of, you know, IT modernization and, and data collection and places we could probably cut data collection and everything else, um, which goes way, way beyond the, the scope of, uh, Things under any any specific individual's domain, except for maybe the uh, the executive. All right, thank you very much for all of those comments. Um, just to speed things along, I do understand there uh, there's at least one agency person who would like to speak, and I believe their line has been unmuted. Um, Amy Bennett, do you want to go ahead? Yes. Hi. Thank you so much, Alina, and I. Um, I believe that there might be one or two other agency people on the line. Um, Fernando, I believe, um, was going to speak for ICE, so you might want to see if he signed in. And then uh, either Tammy Meckley or somebody else from USCIS um, was also planning on joining today. Uh, I want to thank you all so much for the opportunity to review and comment on this draft paper and its recommendations. 
I'm responding with this proposal on behalf of the DHS Deputy Chief FOIA Officer in the DHS Privacy Office. The DHS Privacy Office, under the leadership of the Chief FOIA Officer, has responsibility for overseeing DHS FOIA operations and recommending methods to improve FOIA compliance. We share this working group's goal of providing better access to people who need their records from the Department of Homeland Security. I'm gonna briefly share some of our major concerns with this, with this paper as drafted. We are happy to follow up with the working group members after this meeting to discuss our concerns in greater detail and to collaborate on how we can meet our goal. I'm gonna focus my remarks on our concerns about these recommendations with respect to access to immigration related records in A files. While we are happy that the working group did talk to USCIS, the paper and its recommendations fail to take into account the unique nature of A-files. A-files are the legal custody of USCIS, but they contain records that originate in several other agencies and other DHS components. Some of these records include sensitive law enforcement and even national security information. The agreements and memorandums of understanding that the paper references USCIS uses to process records that originate in other agencies are not simple agreements or arrangements. For example, it took several years of negotiations between USCIS and ICE to reinstate a memorandum of understanding, enabling USCIS to process ICE pages and A-files after the inadvertent release of ICE law enforcement information. The second issue with the draft paper and its recommendations um, relate to process. First, there's no real clear distinction on what is meant by providing access outside of FOIA. We appreciate the IRS's self-service model, and some DHS components have been able to adopt similar models to give people access to certain record sets. For example, CBP provides access to information in the I-94 form for U.S. visitors. However, the example of SSA using non-FOIA personnel through its Skillsoft portal to review and apply Privacy Act and FOIA exemptions does not seem to fit in the same category. While it does seem like a good way to expand the FOIA work workforce, an agency employee is still doing FOIA work. Given the unique nature of A-files and the sensitive law enforcement and national security information in these files, A-files similarly will still need to be reviewed prior to release. It may be possible to reformulate some of these records to separate out what can be released from what cannot but some of these records cannot. They are not created in any sort of a way um, to, make, to make personal access to the records um, possible. They're, they're investigative records um, or, or other types, they, they serve some other purpose other than the, the person um, who, whose information is in those records. DHS has explored shifting responsibility for providing access to A-files to other employees without success. For example, I understand ICE ran a pilot project exploring whether its attorneys could make the records available to people in removal proceedings. ICE's attorneys were not able to pick up these responsibilities and the pilot was ended. We understand the concern that given the volume of A-file requests and the Nightingale court order, the department privileges these requests over other types of requests. First, I would note that USCIS has a specialized team, the significant interest group, that focuses on processing non-A-file requests. Other components that receive a large volume of first party requests, including the DHS Privacy Office, have teams and processes in place to ensure that complex FOIA requests are not ignored. The DHS Privacy Office issues FOIA performance, met uh, performance metrics for components that make it clear ignoring complex requests is not acceptable. We track and monitor the percentage of requests that are more than 200 days old and updated our metrics in this fiscal year to also require the components send out <coughs> responses to older requests. Finally, we can't talk about the issue of, um, with, without this, about this issue without also bringing up the dreaded topic of resources. DHS FOIA has particular expertise in processing records requests and applying exemptions. We have also worked continually to improve our processes and increase the productivity of our workforce. We know that there's more to work to do, and we welcome suggestions for how to improve our performance. There is a real concern, though, that moving responsibility for responding to A-files outside about moving uh, this responsibility outside of the FOIA office. First, the resources needed to do the work will not stay in the FOIA office once the work leaves. Second, whatever office the responsibility is moved to will need time to develop the kinds of processes and expertise we already have in place 
and may end up co costing taxpayers more while providing less customer service. And finally, DHS FOIA will no longer have access to the resources necessary to train up our, our FOIA professionals and develop a workforce that has capacity to handle the kinds of difficult and complex requests we also receive. Again, we really appreciate the opportunity to comment on um, the proposal today, and we really do want to work with you all uh, on um, reformatting the recommendations in a way that is uh, useful for everyone. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Amy. We really appreciate your comments. Are there any other agency folks who want to chime in? Okay, not hearing anyone else. Uh, any other comments or questions from the committee members to each other or to any of the comments that have been offered so far? Or should we move on to the next subcommittee presentation? Could I ask a question in response to that comment? Yes, who is this? This is Alexandra for Lockjaw. Oh, thanks. Um, as as uh, the media representative, but also someone who does immigration law. Um, uh, what percentage of A files do have material redacted before disclosure? Is that the majority, or is that an unusual case that there would be the need to redact or remove national security or other protective information? Uh, I believe the last time I talked to USCIS, it's practically every uh, A file request has at least some information that needs to be redacted, be it you know the name of of, um, of an interviewing officer or or other kinds of information, but but um, Practically every A file request does involve uh, redactions. Thank you. Hi, this is Kel. No, this is my. <laughs> I'm sorry, Elena just asked me a question in the chat. The item that I want to just point out very briefly before we sort of move on to this is to respond both to that answer and to something that, a that Amy had said before. Uh, to the most recent thing, sort of question about the redactions. I I want to caution everybody who's who's talking about a proposal like this to assume that all these redactions are valid. You know, it is a dangerous idea to assume that we shouldn't do a program because ICE redacts a bunch of stuff. Uh, to, say, to say we shouldn't do a program because ICE redacts a bunch of stuff because it assumes that all of ICE's redactions are valid and that the majority of things where they redact things, uh, they should be redacting them. And this is, at least with ICE, I can say for, uh, with expertise, is not always the case. And ICE, for instance, redacts a lot of stuff that is not properly redacted and when challenged and sued, they often unredact it. So that, that is the first point I want to sort of, of caution I want to make. On the resources issue, uh, I would just like to say that, yes, agencies need more FOIA resources. If DHS had enough resources to have a fully functional FOIA shop that did everything that it needed to do in a timely fashion, we probably wouldn't be asking for an alternative to get away from the tremendous FOIA backlog at DHS. So this is going to be an issue one way or the other. I think if the question is giving money to DHS's FOIA office to do more FOIA stuff and giving money to a separate office or a separate division of DHS's FOIA uh, department to do first person, first party requests, those are both involving giving money to DHS and other agencies. And so it, don't go away. Sorry, my phone is ringing. And so that is going to be a problem regardless of what we talk about, but we should not be hung up on, well, don't do a program because it requires more resources when the reason for the problem is that the resources aren't being used or aren't, aren't being made available to the FOIA office. Okay, thanks, Cal. All right, I'm not seeing any other hands. Roger, is that you? Alina? Yeah. Yes. Alina, could yeah. I briefly respond to to some of Kel's comments? Sure. Okay. And then I'll let Roger go. Yes. Sure. 
So, Kel, uh, with respect to to the redactions, you know, point point taken. Um, we, uh, you know, our exemptions are challenged in court all the time. Uh, for us, that's another reason that that these records need to be kept in FOIA, <laughs> where we can have a discussion um, in the court uh, about where about whether or not exemptions are are uh, reasonable and appropriately taken. Uh, the other point on that is the flip side of the coin is that the it, that there. Uh, is a an assumption that all of our that all of our redactions, not just here at DHS, but across the government, um, should not be made. Uh, and I think that especially given the sensitivity of some of the information in A files, that's a really dangerous uh, path to go down. Um, secondly, with respect to the to the comment about about resources, um, you know, we try to be really good stewards of the, of the public's money, and, and we take our responsibility. To provide access, you know, both to people who are looking for their own records and to and to other FOIA requesters, really seriously, you know, at DHS Privacy, we have um, put put together a three-year backlog reduction plan that really looks at at what are the holistic problems with our operations and has laid out a, a blueprint for how we can address those problems. You know, we we don't believe in just throwing mm -hmm. money at the problem because it's been shown over and over again <clears throat> that you can throw money at the problem for one year. And fix it temporarily, um, but you're going to have a problem again in, in the next one to two years. So, you know, we really are trying to have a thoughtful approach to how we can be good, good stewards of the taxpayers' dollars and improve our responsiveness, our, our, our responsiveness to responsiveness to FOIA requests. So, thank you for uh, allowing me to respond. Sure. Okay, Roger, go ahead. I just wanted, I just wanted just to. Um, Clarify me, let me be clear that um, that working group was not was basically suggesting or recommending that all agencies identify commonly requested documents that are that might be much easier provided in an alternative process. Now, in your specifically discussing a files, uh, the working group that I used to work with the USGS is not suggesting. That A files as a whole, whole A file, should be considered as a first party request, even though it is, and that that should have a ten process. What we would recommend to USCIS would be within an A file, look for commonly requested records within that A file that requesters are seeking. For example, you, you mentioned an NA for CVP. That's an example of a specific document. People request for, which other than CB become of the process would have had to be requested in the point. So that's basically one, one, what we're trying to suggest here is look at documents within that your agencies provide to requesters and say, hey, within whether it's Veterans Affairs, EOIR, um, EEOC, wherever, we have certain specific documents. Which probably would have the least amount of redactions, okay, that we can release to requesters outside the FOIA process. I know, for example, I mean, Tommy Mackey discussed, mentioned that um, USCIS has set up what they refer to as the My USCIS, which allows people to submit forms electronically for certain benefits. That is a step in the right direction because. That provides people an opportunity to now have a portal where they have access to documents that they have submitted to the government that they won't, have, they won't have to make a request for those documents. The issue is USCIS has not extended that my USCIS portal to all forms. They just started the process. So yes, um, part of these recommendations is, is to push agencies into either getting more resources, more funding. To get documents in electronic format to make it easier to provide them to, to requesters. For example, ECAS has now come out. ECAS is now a system that allows folks in removal proceedings who are going before the Board of Immigration Appeals to, to get access to their ROPs. Prior to that, they had to make a FOIA request for those documents. Now with ECAS, if you have access to eCash, you don't have to make a FOIA request for ROP. That is what we are talking about. And we certainly are looking forward to working with um, DHS and other 
proponents with regard to how we can make our people better. Specifically with regard to uh, the CASE Act, um, which I think we didn't really focus on some machines because I, I don't think the issue of paper submissions is a problem. I think most requested are submitted for request online. Um, either, I know, for example, you know, USCIS has their portals. Uh, you has a portal. So I don't think paper submissions is an issue. I think the issue is, and again, Michael said this, a lot of the problems happen before it gets to FOIA. A lot of records are created in paper. They're not in electronic formats, which means that they're dispersed all over the place. It makes it difficult to collect these documents. It makes it difficult to collect them. It makes it difficult to process them. It makes it difficult to release them. So we should be looking at how do we make sure that most records are in an electronic format where you don't have to move papers around, where it makes it easier for access to the documents. Because once you take care of those things, the making mm -hmm. disclosures become much easier. Again, Alina, if I could just briefly uh, respond to the comments. Roger, we appreciate, uh, we appreciate the, the clarification uh, about the purpose um, that is, you know, and we're happy to talk about specific files or, or, or um, forms that we can make, um, you know, better available to the public. We certainly have uh, done a lot of work in that area. And I'll say that, you know, we are generally providing access to all records, um, you know, kind of the, the first party requested about in about 30 working days. Um, but, you know, I'll also say that that's not the way that the recommendation is currently written. Um, you know, it talks a lot about, um, USCIS and in particular access to A files through through a, a non a non uh, FOIA uh, purpose. So you know that that might be something that, that just needs to be to be clarified uh, within sure. the, the recommendation. Um, secondly, with respect to your your point about um, paper, I think that that's a that's a really good point. Um, and certainly, you know, that it's uh, in the government's interest to begin collecting and keeping um, paper in an electronic format. Uh, I would note, though, that um, the legal format for uh, A files in particular is paper uh, for, for a variety of reasons, including some that um, people at the National Archives would be much better suited to, to speaking to uh, other than me. So that might be another, um, if the committee is interested in going in this direction, um, another area where, you, you know, a little bit more work needs to be done um, in terms of how, why is the government keeping information in a, in a paper based system uh, in the 20 in the, in the 21st century. It's not just because we don't like change. All right, thanks, Amy. Uh, I saw that Tuan had his hand up and then he respectfully took it down. Tuan, do you want to add anything to the discussion? Uh, I was just going to, to say that, uh, you know, I think technology provides a lot of opportunities, of course, as well as risks. But, uh, you know, sometimes we can learn from Newer countries and smaller countries, and I'm just thinking about Estonia and what an amazing example it has been, where 99% of its services are available online with documents being generated natively, electronically. Uh, and um, Alexander Howard has posted several uh, comments that are very helpful uh, in the chat, including uh, referencing, uh, you know, the ability to get you know, data that's very sensitive, health-related data. Um, and uh, self-service portals really provide uh, effectively a for, FOIA force multiplier in the sense that, you know, the uh, citizen is able to get access to this material and, and is able to uh, help themselves. And, and so I, I, I do think that it is uh, worth thinking about how going forward, uh, you know, portals uh, might work. And, and uh, the other comment, I think that, um, that Alexander had made uh, was that perhaps uh, we also need to think about how state files are created because, you know, I, I don't know, uh, again, if we have a repeated uh, redaction need to remove the names of a particular, uh, you know, interviewing asylum officers, I, I just wonder if there are alternative ways to sort of generate the documents so that you don't have to create that work that you have to later go in and do again. Um, I think there may be ways to, to expedite this. And, and given uh, Mike Morrissey's point earlier about uh, GDPR uh, compliance, uh, you know, it seems like 
we can certainly do this. Okay, thanks, Tron. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm interested in trying to wrap up this conversation only for today, because I think we need to continue. Uh, I think this will get carried over to our next meeting. Uh, lots to think about, uh, Alexis and the working group. And I wanna thank both Michael mm -hmm. and Alexis for, as the subcommittee co-chairs for leading this and uh, to be continued. So thank you very much for everyone's thoughtful comments. Um, I wanna give the legislation subcommittee a brief opportunity to do a quick report out uh, before we turn to public comments. I understand AJ and David Collier wanted to give some comments. So AJ, do you wanna go first? Sure thing, uh, I will be exceptionally brief. Um, I will just give you uh, the quickest overview of uh, a survey that we have out there. I've just posted it in uh, the link to it in uh, the chat. Um, it has been put together by myself, Dr. David Collier, and Michael Morrissey. Um, there's been two rounds of sampling thus far. We, the first round of sampling, we worked with uh, Michael and some muckrock requesters. So we have certified or verified requesters uh, responding. And now we're into the second phase uh, of the sample where we've tossed it out to anybody. So this is where I ask you folks uh, if you know any uh, distribution methods uh, to get this in front of people that have taken uh, or submitted FOI requests, whether state, local, or federal, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, this survey is designed to serve two purposes. Um, obviously, we are here to serve subcommittee uh, uh, questions, but also to do a little bit of uh, scholarly work as well for Dr. Dave Collier and myself. Um, and we sought feedback and input from the committee, and we received a lot of helpful notes uh, from a number of the committee members. Um, some of the subjects in the survey include uh, OGIS authority. There's a, quite a few questions on fees, metadata concerns, uh, FOIA logs, uh, applying FOIA to legislature and judiciary, first person requesting uh, websites uh, across the board, lots of stuff that we're interested in across our various subcommittees. There's also some uh, some scholarly stuff in there that Dave and I are interested in as far as experiences, behaviors uh, by request or category, demographics, uh, government type stuff of that nature. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's still active and we're still looking to reach as wide of an audience as possible. Uh, we're not quite as far along as we'd like to be as far as number of respondents. So again, any help is greatly appreciated. Uh, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions you may have regarding the survey. Um, but that's about all I have as far as just a very brief uh, recap. Uh, AJ, do you mind if I ask, is there a deadline for the survey? Does it close by a certain date? Th yes, this current round is uh, will close on Monday, December 13th. Is there a chance that you might be able to extend that deadline? Absolutely. Okay. All right. Good to know. Thank you. Uh, David, are you on? Would you like to say a few words about your the work you've been doing uh yeah can you hear me uh, alina yes absolutely uh, okay great thank you yeah i'm david coolier an associate professor at the university of arizona and president of the national freedom of information coalition and i'm joined in this working group by aj and tom sussman and patricia webb now we've been gathering information this fall to examine foia oversight models in the states and around the world to see if there are ways we might be able to improve the oversight structure within the U.S. FOIA system. Uh, while wor working, this working group has been labeled as reimagining OGIS, I think it's important to make it clear that we're not looking at the performance of OGIS or NARA or federal agencies. You know, I can't speak for others, but I believe OGIS has been a benefit to the country and that the nine staff members work very hard. I can't imagine reimagining Alina Kirsten or anyone else at OGIS. So, um, in fact, one thing that's emerged from our research is that OGIS does a lot of very little. From the figures we've gathered so far on a per capita basis, OGIS is actually the most short-staffed office in the world. And that's even when compared to states, provinces, and cities. I mean, to put that in context, OGIS's staffing level is equivalent to FOI mediation agencies in Israel and the Yukon Territory. And staffing levels are greater among at least 40 other jurisdictions, including Connecticut with 16 staffers, Philippines at 41, Peru 780, Brazil 2,200. I mean, surely, you know, we could do better here. So 
So far, we've talked to dozens of experts and gleaned uh, a lot of research, and uh, we're seeing consistent themes when it comes to ideal structures, particularly when it comes to an organization's independence, its authority, its resources. For example, more than 60 nations have oversight agencies that have the power to compel agencies to disclose records without a requester having to hire an attorney and going to court. And, and it's, all, uh, it's almost in all cases free. In some cases, agencies have provided more protections and independence from the executive branch, and including in their budget. And some models include remedies within the judiciary to streamline the system and reduce litigation, including in the state of Ohio, for example. It seems to be working very well. A lot of really interesting practices out there we're looking at, and we hope to share a draft report uh, at the beginning of this next year, January, uh, spread around, get feedback discussion before the March meeting. And we'd like to include the ideal model uh, of what the perfect structure would look like. Understanding, you know, that there could be some challenges getting that applied uh, in any timely fashion, but it would also probably include some short-term recommendations as well. Uh, while we work on this, we welcome further input, thoughts from the committee members, thoughts from anyone else. So if anybody wants to talk about this uh, topic, I'd be happy to do so. Uh, just reach out. Thank you. All right, David, thank you so much. I'm just going to quickly ask uh, if anyone has any questions for either AJ or David. They've been doing a lot of great work. I don't see any hands up in the chat. So I've asked everyone on the committee if they could stay a little past one o'clock. I know we have um, some public comments that we would want to receive and most folks have, a, um, have the ability to stay a little past one. I believe Michael Morrissey has to sign off at 1 p.m. So your homework assignment is to tune back in and read the transcript and watch the YouTube video later to see what you miss. Um, same goes for anyone else, but um, at this time, I just want to turn my attention to public comments. We look forward to hearing from any non-committee participants who have ideas or comments to share. Uh, we're capturing all oral comments in the transcript. Um, any member of the public may speak or otherwise address the committee, and uh, we're going to go ahead and ask Michelle now, our event producer, are there anyone, is there anyone queued up on the telephone line? And would you be able to have, uh, would you be able to share instructions again, Michelle, uh, as to how to um, call in on the telephone line, please? Absolutely, Alina. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, as we enter um, into the into the public uh, comment uh, session, um, you can press the raise hand icon, which is above the chat panel. You'll see a little icon. And um, so that's how you can ask via WebEx audio. If you are on the regular audio line, you will need to press pound two on your, um, on your telephone line. Okay. okay. So that's how you would get into the queue. And it looks like we do have somebody actually in, in queue, Elaine, and we do have Alexander Howard. Okay. Um, Alex, go ahead, please. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for hosting this public meeting on uh, FOIA. I can't tell you how much I appreciate uh, your commitment to these issues and your commitment to hosting these forums in public uh, for the entire country to be able to hear the debate back and forth. Um, these issues are really complicated, and uh, the dedication that you all have shown to engaging with them um, is admirable. And as we head into I hope uh, a season when the United States will be re-engaging on the United States uh, commitments to the Open Government Partnership next year. It's worth noting that this committee exists because of the second national action plan. And I hope that um, as we move forward, that that will be reified um, as something that is valuable. Um, I know that there are some challenges, though, with respect to getting these recommendations before Congress in a way that's actionable and gets them to be incorporated into reform and I hope that you'll continue to be advocates internally and externally for agencies taking actions that don't require legislative action. Um, and that 
I think um, is going to require a somewhat different public posture and just some feedback and public engagement. It would be wonderful if the co-chair of the committee, the Department of Justice Office of Information Policy, would promote the fact that these things are happening using social media, press releases, and otherwise encouraging all of the different stakeholders that exist to know that this is something that's out there and for all of the different people who were involved in the process um, to be more engaged in it. Um, I know that it feels somewhat lonely to show up at the archives and see sparse attendance online. I think that's even more stark. Um, what I wanted to say today, however, is a bit focused on something else, um, which is the sunsetting of FOIA online. Um, for uh, a lot of people, um, that is how they engage with the federal government and FOIA. They, they go to FOIAonline.gov and dozens of agencies use it. Um, as confirmed um, by OGIS, by OIP at DOJ, um, this is something that's going to be uh, sunset um, over you know, the next coming months. And I hope that the committee will use that as an opportunity to think about um, how FOIA should work online in ways that it doesn't currently. And I think today's discussion is a really useful articulation of that um, in terms of thinking about how and where access to people's personal files, personal data can and should be available to them safely and securely online using a lot of the existing pathways that I identified in chat. The thing that I think um, is a huge opportunity ahead of you all is to consider how and where FOIA.gov could and should work um, if there were an application programming interface on it that enabled third-party applications, uh, a whole ecosystem of applications um, created by nonprofits or for-profit um, entities to be able to make and track FOIA requests that go into FOIA.gov and go to agencies. Um, this is something that can and should, I think, be nurtured um, cooperatively um, through the different pathways that exist around data disclosures that exist elsewhere in federal government. If you look at the communities of practice that exist around categories of data at data.gov, the same kind of thing could and should be working at a FOIA.gov that's been rebuilt with the people it serves by the Office of Information Policy and the GSA's 18F team. Um, using open standards um, based on a common schema for FOIA data um, that creates a much more open and collaborative process and, I would hope, creates a different kind of role for the Federal FOIA Ombuds Office to help people through that process and seize where they're getting stuck in um, the, the, the delivery of this as a service. Um, and it's my hope that you all won't just stop with having a showcase and promoting a showcase to vendors, that this is something that you'll actually be building with the stakeholders who make FOIA requests to ensure that FOIA.gov isn't just a place to get FOIA stats. It's a place that every American knows they can go to to get information that is our right about a government um, or about ourselves if our information is within government. Um, and I, I want to put this out in front of you all as a challenge. We're going to have a, a great opportunity in this next year to talk about open government, talk about democracy, talk about um, technology that improves democracy, as the president just talked about this morning, as this conversation we're having, uh, is global. Um, and to learn from other nations where they've done this better, and to learn from American states and cities that are doing this better, that are explicitly connecting disclosures um, in FOIA reading rooms, quote unquote, um, with the kind of structured, machine readable disclosures we're seeing in open data. Um, and the end result should be someone being able to go to FOIA.gov doing a search and have it go all across the reading rooms, go all across usdata.gov, and then be able to see what's out there and what's missing. And for anyone to understand who's asked for these things before, instead of having the logs be obfuscated, and for Congress and GAO and um, the Ombuds off offices and you all to have an ongoing, almost real-time dashboard to understand the state of compliance. And in theory, that should enable all of us to not have to wait for these governance processes to trickle through, but to be able to identify where and how there are stopping points in the process that are preventing people from exercising their rights, and frankly, to see where there are stopping points in the bureaucracy which suggest that OIP should be pushing them um, much harder. Um, because I don't think anyone can argue with a straight face that what we have right now is good enough across the board. Um, Thank you for All right. Yeah. Uh, Take care.
Thank you so much for your comment. We appreciate that. Um, we are moving on to the next um, caller in queue. Before we move on, can I just respond to that? Your line yeah. is unmuted. You may go ahead. My second, Michelle. I think I she wants going. to respond. Yeah, a quick response. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just lose my train of thought on it while I look at the questions. I appreciate it. And Alex, it's good to hear your voice. I appreciate your uh, your comments. Um, I just wanted to say, so many of the things that you mentioned are things that we're working on. Um, the 10X team that, uh, and I mentioned this at the CFO Council, um, we're really happy that we're working with a 10X team in phase three to do exactly as you said, make it so that we're searching across agency FOIA libraries and one location on FOIA.gov um, and plugging in other uh, places uh, where records such as data.gov um, uh, are available proactively. So the idea being that the requester goes to FOIA.gov, they can do a search, see what's out there across the government, um, even inform where they may make a request if that search doesn't suffice, uh, uh, make it um, so that they're, uh, they're satisfied with their uh, with the records they're looking for. Um, so we, we are doing that work. I think um, uh, there's a lot of work to be done. There always will be a lot of work to be done, but we're working um, positively to build on FOIA.gov and agencies are working to build on their proactive disclosures, and we're gonna continue to support that. Uh, and also, I just want to say that FOIA.gov, of course, is not just a site to go um, and see FOIA statistics. Back in 2010, when we launched it, that was the uh, that was the initial goal. But since then, we've added so many, so much more to the site, including standardized forms for making a request. So requesters can go and make a request from FOIA.gov from a single location, and having landing pages for each agency that has specific information about their FOIA processing on that page so that it's all easily accessible, their FOIA regulations, their FOIA reference hands books. I can go on and on, so I won't monopolize the time, but I just wanted to say thank you for your comments. Um, but certainly, that's the kind of feedback we want to get because we want to improve FOIA.gov. We're not resting on our laurels, um, but a lot of this stuff is stuff we're working on. Bobby, thanks very much. Um, Michelle, I understand there might be a couple of other callers who would like to offer some comments. Yes, we do have Freddie Martinez on the line. Freddie, you may go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having us here. Uh, I'm Freddie Martinez. I'm a policy analyst at Open the Government. Um, and we're here, I mean, I thank you for having us because, you know, I think this is a unique place where we can discuss some of the challenges that we've been seeing with FOIA right now. Um, I know that we've spoken individually with members of the committee, uh, members of the subcommittee, OIP, OGIS, and others, both publicly and privately, about some of the things that we're seeing. Um, first, I mean, I, I guess the place to start is that, you know, I think a lot of us in our community are surprised at the lack of commitment to transparency and FOIA um, in the first year of the administration, at least um, anything that we've seen publicly. Um, for example, you know, we've been waiting for almost a full year for a memo from the Attorney General on FOIA and how agencies should be complying with FOIA's presumption of openness. And while we appreciate that the White House gives independence to the Attorney General's office, um, you know, if you look back in 2009, uh, Attorney, General, Attorney General Holder had a memo out uh, about a month into the administration um, at the same time, we saw President Obama had a day one memo on how agencies should be treating FOIA. And, and you know, it's disappointing to see that we're almost a full year into a new administration and we haven't seen similar movement. Um, and, and we've talked about this previously in other venues, but, you know, I think we really want to see a Gen Attorney General Garland talking about how agencies should be maximizing proactive disclosure, reiterating that agencies have to treat discretionary exemptions as discretionary. Um, agencies should be uh, directed to improve their customer service and the importance of communication, especially during remoteness. Um, the other thing that we really want to see is that the Department of Justice really take a hard line on not defending agency officials back in bad faith or in clear violation of the spirit of FOIA. Um, for example, uh, agencies seem to have a far different uh, understanding of the word reasonable as it appears in the FOIA throughout the text, and many times it appears. Um, and it seems to be quite different than what the dictionary definition of reasonable means. And, you know, we would hope to see that the DOJ and agency lawyers under a new administration would revisit this policy. Um, so those are just some ideas that we really um, 
think should be at the forefront of, of the new administration, and we haven't seen um, that reflected um, anywhere publicly. Um, and the reason we bring these comments to today is because we care deeply about um, the FOIA Advisory Committee's recommendation and hope that both Congress and the executive branch begin to seriously implement them. Um, for example, you know, we've hoped that OMB would uh, more seriously implement the recommendation um, for adding but, uh, line budget items for FOIA officers. This, you know, this recommendation could be done through executive action. It doesn't have to depend on the White House. It doesn't have to depend on Congress. Um, and we haven't seen any of those kinds of recommendations moving forward. Um, and, and then finally, just a few other things. One, one thing that we had also hoped would have improved in, an, in an, a new administration is communication about FOIA in general. I know Alex Howard talked about the subsetting of FOIA.gov, uh, but that also was not communicated well to the public. I, I think someone from the subcommittee called it an announcement, but um, that description doesn't seem to fit. Um, many of us found out about the sunsetting through a listserv. Uh, we didn't find out through like any kind of official channels, any kind of press release. Um, in fact, when I heard about it, people were, um, were asking if this was true and we thought it was a new endo. We thought it was people speculating because uh, of how poor of a job the EPA did of communicating the reasons for the shutdown, what happens to open requests, what the new systems might be, when they'll be open, et cetera. Um, and so that's just one example of, of frustrations we're seeing in the community. Um, and then finally, you know, we hope that Congress steps in, uh, steps up in its role of providing oversight in FOIA. It's been about five and a half years since we've had open hearings on agency compliance with FOIA, the public's um, view of how FOIA is working or not working. And we hope that Congress will move more quickly on um, just comprehensive FOIA oversight reform um, and improvement in general. Thanks. Thank you for Thanks, your Thanks, Freddie. I really appreciate that. Um, Michelle, I know we have one more caller in queue. Should we um, open up that we one? Do. On we do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have one more caller in queue. Call your line is unmuted. You may go ahead. Yes, hi, everybody. This is Bob Hammond. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Hey, I'm going to be extremely uh, brief. Uh, the comments that I would make orally, I have placed into the panelist chat and also into YouTube, and I sent them by email. So those are records that have been presented to the committee. Uh, my understanding of the law is that they have to be included in the minutes. So with that understanding, uh, what I'd like to say is most of my comments uh, go to what's already been said, that the OGIS staff is magnificent. I mean, they're super people, but they are just so grossly underfunded that they cannot do their mission. You cannot mediate 4,600 cases in a year with three people. That's physically impossible. Oh, just isn't doing it because they're not able to. When Congress established the requirements for OGIS and OIP, they didn't provide any additional funding. So I'm trying to work with Congress and others on that on that common goal, uh, and so. A lot of my public comments uh, today show what happens when you're grossly underfunded. They're not meant to be uh, mean to anybody, uh, but I put them into the public domain because we just need to understand how grossly underfunded OGIS is. And I would say the same thing about OIP. Bobby doesn't complain a, a lot, but they are similarly just grossly underfunded for their uh, compliance mission. So uh, with that, I want to thank you all, uh, and my, uh, uh, many of my comments are posted, uh, and I have put my uh, email address on the, uh, the cover slides of those. It's foiacompliance at gmail.com, so if anybody wants to contact me, please do, and I'll uh, spend some time with you. Thank you very much. Great meeting. Thank okay, you thanks, so much. Mr. Hammond. Um, I believe Bobby wanted to address a couple of the comments that were made earlier. Bobby, do you want to go ahead and have the floor? Yeah, thank you, Alina, and I just wanted to respond to Freddie, and I want to thank Freddie for joining the meeting and for his comments. We appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to say that the, uh, the department has fully supports um, the uh, furthering the purpose of the FOIA and all of the uh, many of the principles that Freddie mentioned, particularly proactive disclosures, uh, but the in the attorney general emphasize the importance in public statements at our, at our, in his first full week 
for, uh, in, in a, the first day of his first full week as attorney general um, at our Sunshine Week event, emphasizing that without accountability, democracy is impossible. And democratic accountability requires the kind of transparency that FOIA makes possible. And recently, uh, our chief FOIA officer council meeting, a public or public chief FOIA officer council meeting, the associate attorney general of the United States emphasized uh, or echoed that um, sentiment and emphasized the importance of FOIA. And in particular, uh, being the CFO council meeting the important role, role of leadership at agency and the CFOs um, in uh, all aspects of FOIA administration. Uh, that to say, we're you know the administration, the department is committed to the uh, government wide FOIA administration. Uh, and we're, you know, there, there's more to come and we look forward to, and I look forward to continue to work with um, Freddie, uh, you and, and the requester community as we advance these principles. Okay, thanks, Bobby. I really appreciate that. Uh, I am very thankful for everyone staying over our allotted time today. I know at 117, I'm just going to quickly wrap up. Um, thank all the committee members for all the great work that you've done so far. Um, we're definitely in the home stretch uh, for June of 2022, and I anticipate a really lively meeting in March of next year. Um, while you're enjoying the holidays, please think about volunteering to be on the final report and recommendations working group next spring. Uh, this group works on the final report that the committee will be expected to vote on at the last meeting in June of 2022. Uh, last term, the working group met weekly beginning in March to craft the final report. Um, see Patricia Weth uh, for insider tips on the fact that she loved it and survived and lived to tell about it. Um, and uh, if you are interested, please let me and Kirsten know. Uh, so far, I have zero volunteers. So please consider this a holiday gift to me and Kirsten. Um, uh, if you can volunteer, that would be great. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. I hope everyone and their families remain safe, healthy, and resilient. Uh, we will see each other again, most likely virtually, I predict, at our next meeting, Thursday, March 10th, 2022, starting at 10 a.m. And if anyone has any other comments, I'm happy to listen. Otherwise, I would like to call this meeting to a close. Any committee members have any other comments or questions? Okay, hearing none. Uh, happy holidays, happy new year to all, and we stand adjourned. Thank you.